Good morning. Uh, the March 29 uh, special board of directors meeting is called to order. First, I'd like to ask our interpreters to explain how to access interpretation. So please go ahead. Announcement from interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please okay. scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as language. Okay. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you are in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Okay. Aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish, Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., uh, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, silenciar audio original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de reunión, favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Thank you. Let's go ahead and uh, start with the tribal acknowledgement. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land we call home. The tribal nations of the San Diego region have historically faced injustices. We acknowledge the harmony that existed between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systemic oppression. We pay our respects to the unceded territory and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States, from four cultural groups, the Cumia, the Guineo, the Luceño, the Cupeño, and the Cahuilla. <clears throat> this land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandak community, we acknowledge this legacy and we aspire to learn from indigenous traditional knowledge and experiences in undoing the injustices of the past. Please now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Father, of the United States, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, Ms. Tessa, can you please confirm quorum? Good morning. We have 16 of 19 voting jurisdictions present and one advisory member, and that confirms the quorum. Thank you. So in compliance with the Brown Act's specifications for special meetings, non-agenda public comment member comments are not scheduled for today's agenda. However, we will be accepting public comments on agenda item number one after the presentation. We're gonna begin uh, with our item on today's agenda, which is item number one, the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor's Investigation Report on SR 125 Total Operations. I'm gonna uh, welcome uh, Courtney and her team as uh, they worked on examining this issue. And I wanna also welcome the chair of our audit committee, uh, David Cito. So I'll turn it over to Courtney. Just taking a short, oh yeah. Thanks chair. Um, first, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for making the time to show up on such short notice for a special meeting. This is a very, significant uh, investigation and, uh, and there were definitely some real problems identified and it's really great to see the, the seriousness and everybody making the time to do this. I also wanna thank the audit committee for making time for a special meeting on Tuesday to hear this particular item. Um, just starting off that uh, you'll hear the investigation report. I did ask the auditor to start out with just a brief discussion since this is the first investigation that's been brought forward to the board, a little bit of a difference between investigation and audit. Um, one of the primary things that's worth pointing out is that um, this is earlier than what you would get for an audit. So the management has not had their full time to create a response yet. So um, normally when we bring audits forward, you would see a full management response and well, I'm sure management will be here to answer some questions. Um, they haven't fully drafted their response yet to the best of my knowledge. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Courtney. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more thing. Yeah, I did want to mention the audit committee did unanimously vote to recommend approving all of the recommend uh, to approve all of the recommendations. We also did have 
three additional recommendations of our own that I will address at the end uh, after Courtney makes her presentation. Thank you, Chair Zito. Members of the board, thank you for having my team and I today to present this important investigation. I do want to start off to explain what the difference between a performance audit and an investigation is for the public. So performance audit provides an objective analysis so that management and those charged with governance and oversight can use the information to improve program performance and operations, reduce cost, facilitate decision-making by parties with responsibility to oversee or initiate corrective action and contribute to public accountability. An investigation, on the other hand, involves a detailed examination and analysis of specific events, allegations, or su suspicions of wrongdoing. It aims to uncover the truth, gather evidence, and determine the extent of any potential wrongdoing. So as you see, the report before you today states the facts of what we know occurred in relation to the objectives, and I'll go over that. Why we publish an investigation, and we haven't done so in the past, is in the interest of public, of the public and you all as a governing board to know what occurred so that then moving forward, things can be correct, corrected and this won't happen again. That has always been my practice to issue significant substantiated investigations. This is not new. It, as in my career, I understand this is new, new for SANDAG. As the chair stated, we first issue the report on Monday, and that is the first time management or anyone outside of OIPA has seen the report. So now management has two weeks to prepare a response to the investigation report. With that, I don't have a clicker. Okay, now I do. Excellent. <clears throat> so as stated, we're here to present the investigation of State Route 125 Toll Operations Report. My OIPA performed this, myself as a lead investigator, and Doug DePeat, the whistleblower program manager, as the other investigator. As you all know, in December, the Independent Performance Auditor, Audit Committee, Board Chair, and several board members determined that the publicly disclosed allegations regarding customer mischarges and accounting issues warranted an independent investigation. So why this matters is it has given the impact on the toll, the toll customers as well as the community at large. It is critical for the Board of Directors and the public to understand what occurred and how SANDAG management can prevent this from occurring in the future. A history, we know that the board was um, briefed in closed session in October due to the operational issues around ETAN. In November, the former director of accounting and finance did file a lawsuit. And in December, OIPA launched an uh, investigation. We are not investigating the lawsuit brought by the former director of accounting and finance. We are looking into significant issues that must be discovered and must be understood in a timely manner for both the board and the public and management to move forward. The objectives were to determine if SANDAG's SR-125 financial accounting can be relied upon, if SANDAG rectified those publicly reported errors with customer accounts that were shared here in December, and if there are any other significant matters that we noted during the investigation. The investigation is divided into three sections. The first section will talk about SR-125 accounting issues. Section two will talk about the status of publicly reported errors with customer accounts. And section three will talk about other reportable matters. For section one, our first finding was that ETAN BOS fast lane financial reporting cannot be relied upon and that SANDAG's finance department lacks adequate internal controls, including proper review and supervision to ensure SR-125 financial information is recorded and reported accurately. This section is divided into multiple subheaders. The first thing we found is that SANDAG did have mitigation strategies that they were putting forth to address the high risk. We talk about a couple high risks in the report. One of them is that the CAPS roadway system was that they didn't want to hold back 
on, they didn't want to create any further delay in the transition or what we call the cutover or going live in SR 125. So they moved forward with the go live on June 6, 2022. And they reduced functionality in the system in order to do that. They also, in one of their mitigation strategies, was to have increased monitoring. What we know is the mitigation strategies were insufficient for what occurred after SR-125 went live. We also know that Sandag's finance staff noted significant concerns. So in June of 2022, SR-125 goes live. Within a month, you already have the senior account, accounting accountant saying, I have briefed, I have given this presentation a lot this week uh, in individual briefings, so forgive me, my, I'm a little tongue tied. <clears throat> what we know is that the finance staff saw concerns right away. They knew that the trial balance was not functional. They also had one of the accountant staff members saying something's going wrong with accounts receivable and deferred revenue. Items are going in and out and not knowing why. Due to the workload on the finance staff and also their focus was to close the financial audit for the previous year as well as do the bond reporting for the next the second quarter that they couldn't look at those deviations for six months so they saw it in the fall of 2022 they weren't able to start investigating it until the spring of 2023 we know that the finance staff was frustrated that ETAN wouldn't prioritize their needs. There's an email in the report from ETAN tolling staff to Sandag finance staff saying, this is, I just wanna say, this is nine months after SR 125 goes live and asking them for basic financial reports saying to the finance staff, are these the things you need on a monthly basis? Do you need reconciliation? Do you need daily reports? So this stuff should have been handled before the crossover. As part of, uh, we, we know that Sandag initiated workarounds because they couldn't rely on the information in the system, but yet they still had to account for the money. So they used bank statements and credit card reconciliations in order to gather that information and be able to record the revenues for cash and credit cards. ETAN, in addition, there were, um, in addition to finance staff, also toll st ops staff were doing queries. And this is listed in right before the system goes live. One of the h and reports to Sandag, they talk about how ETAN is using queries to get financial reporting information out. So that is in before the system goes live in May of 2022. Um, that continues to this day that queries are being used to actually extract needed data. h and as part of their contract, were required to validate the reports. So they did a validation process in May using data from March. These are reports that ETAN would run. Then h and would go in and test. The reports that were provided, either most of them failed or they didn't run at all. ETAN's reporting system is inconsistent and balances cannot always be relied upon. We have an error in the report that we point out. So the ending trial balance, the where you end your financial year, that should be your beginning balance for the next year. We have an error noted in the report of $150,000 that the changes, the ending balance between the ending balance and the beginning balance, which should be one and the same. We know that Sandag's control environment over SR-125 financial reporting was insufficient to ensure reliable reporting. I have a whole slide on that, so I'll go over that. I'll also talk about the difference between materiality versus accuracy and other issues. So when we talk about the control environment, this is Sandag's finance department. This is completely how the internal controls within the financial reporting. We found that it was insufficient, those controls, to ensure reliable reporting. The first bullet point in the report talks about unearned revenue re is reconciled only annually for year-end financial statements. This reconciliation should happen either on a monthly basis and or we're at a minimum on a quarterly basis. Unearned revenue, just to further describe it, if you have a fast track account, 
today and you have $20 on your fast track account, that would be your prepaid customer balance. To Sandag, that's unearned revenue. Until you cross the toll, then we pull it over as revenue. Not we, but Sandag does. The financial statements are produced quarterly or annually, and it is to satisfy either annual audit requirements or quarterly bond reporting. What you would anticipate is that your financials, your financial reporting is done on a monthly basis, the reconciliations, those reports are prepared so that management can utilize them to make decisions as well as the board, um, but we weren't seeing that. It was really driven from either the audit or the bond reporting. The year-end journal entries were posted without supporting documentation or insufficient documentation, and or they had to backtrack in their work. So we requested the year-end journal entries. This is to make sure everything's correct when the financial statements are produced. And that's what we found, that in one, uh, some of the journal entries, the accountant needed to go back and recreate their work because they were moving so fast to get everything done that it, the documentation wasn't there. Um, we also found that numbers were either trued up or trued down to make the entries post. A common fee, revenue, and expense allocation method, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, it's just the method wasn't documented, and you, anytime we allocate, we take an allocation method that should be fully documented, and when we asked for supporting documentation, they had to go back, interview the finance staff, and then come back to us with an explanation, accounts receivable policy does not exist. You always wanna have an accounts receivable policy to know what your collection is. Um, and here they did not have that. We did look at the accounts receivable accrual. We found that the analysis that they were presenting to us was reasonable. However, you need a policy to, to show that. We also know that the accounts receivable balance at the end of the year in QuickBooks could not be relied upon. Um, as well as they cannot produce an accounts receivable aging report. And then lastly, there isn't daily monitoring from the CAPS roadway system into ETAN's fast lane BOS system. So what that means is you go on to SR-125 and you are going an entry point. When you exit, your toll is captured in the CAP system. It is calculated. They know when you came on, when you got off, and how much that should be calculated at. That information is then trans transmitted over to ETAN's BOS system. And that daily monitoring to make sure what happened on the roadway is ending up in BOS is not occurring. Materiality versus accuracy. The distinction here and in December and the end of the year, materiality was talked about. It was said that the errors aren't material. So I just want to make sure that you understand that is a financial statement accounting principle. And that is a decision that is made by the financial statement auditors to say that we could have, for example, you could have a $100,000 error. You could have 40,000, excuse me, 40 million in revenue. That is 0.25% of that 40 million in revenue. If they don't book that 100,000 entry in the financial statements, the end user will not be impacted. So that's what materiality is about. It is not a concept that is used in your day-to-day -day accounting. In your day-to-day -day accounting, your accounting system must be accurate and should be recorded to the penny. Some other issues we found is that the account customer account balance summary report, this is a report that was supposed to be ready when SR-125 went live. It wasn't ready for 13 months. When it was ready, it had errors in it. I also talked about previously that an accountant had noticed that errors were going in and out of the report. So this is a part of that problem as well. We talk about this in the second section of the report when we say what Sandag did in relation to the errors around the customer accounts. Next, ETAN system posted incorrect data when inaccurately programmed. This is simply garbage in, garbage out. The system was programmed wrong. It would then inaccurately post information. We talked to Sandag staff as well as contractors and even someone at ETAN th themselves said, sometimes we would fix one problem and it would cause another. So again, you're seeing a picture of the instability in the system and the, the lack of reliability. 
there's a lack of system and baseline documentation. We go into this in the report in more detail in a couple places. You'll see ETAN's comments around that. So they didn't have the documentation on the system and they didn't have the baseline documentation. So because ETAN experienced high personnel turnover, people were coming into the project management roles at ETAN. And when they looked at the documentation or the roadmap, it wasn't there in order for them to actually fix problems. So we know they couldn't always fix the problems. So the conclusion in section one is the investigation found the financial information in ETAN's BOS could not be relied upon and members of SANDAG's executive management were aware of the system's inability to produce reliable financial reports. Additionally, the finance department lacks sufficient internal controls, including proper supervision and timely reconciliation. Senior financial management allowed the situation to persist and did not intercede at an operational level to ensure the reliability of the financial information. Instead, they dismissed these concerns as not material. The recommendation for this section is we recommend an independent assessment of the finance department's policies, procedures, and practices to ensure adequate internal controls, including proper review and supervision overall of Sandag's financial operations. We felt with the level of accounting practices that we were seeing with SR 125, that it would not be responsible to isolate this just to SR 125, that the entire finance department needs to be evaluated from top to bottom for policies, procedures, and practices so that you all have the confidence as well as management that finances or financial reporting is occurring accurately. This is section two of the report. And this is where we talk about the errors that were presented in December to you all. What was the resolution on those? So we found for the publicly disclosed customer general ledger errors, none of the underlying software programming or configuration error issues in ETAN's BOS has been fixed. So that means the errors that were caused will persist unless adjusting entries are made. So what we know, and I'll go through some of the examples, ETAN fixed some of them in the general ledger system. SANDAG fixed them in QuickBooks for the financial statement reporting, but in the underlying system documentation and configuration, they're not fixed. So again, those errors will persist and they will always have to be adjusted for when financial reporting is coming out of the system. Lastly, some errors continue to be researched. So this is by the numbers. The CFO reported to you in December how many accounts were impacted and the impacts of those. This is very similar to what was reported out in December. It's about 88,000 accounts were impacted. 49,000 of those accounts are issues with the general ledger and 8,900 continue to be researched. I wanna make it very clear and we worked hard to make this distinction in the report. These are general ledger issues. So the information came into the system from the roadway system, caps over to ETAN. It got populated into the customer transactions we're seeing we're not seeing issues with those customer transactions in relation to these errors. The error occurred when the system, this is all happening within ETAN system, when the system from the customer transactions went to communicate to the general ledger, the financial reporting in ETAN. That's where the error happened. 49,000 of those have been corrected. Um, again, either in the general ledger system and they have been corrected in QuickBooks to have the accurate financial reporting. However, they've not been corrected in the system. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through every error unless you would desire that, but every error is outlined in the report. So I'll walk through one of the slides. We had one manual error, everything else is system generated. So for example, the penalty reversal, this affected 131 counts. The revenue effect was $52,000. Was it fixed in the general ledger? No, it was not. Was it fixed in QuickBooks? Yes. And were the underlying software systems fixed? No.
We know that about 8,900 accounts remain to be fixed. Fagan was hired to research these differences. They're still working on that. They've issued two reports, um, excuse me, one report, and they just issued a revision to that report. And this is their conclusion. Again, it gives you an idea how difficult it is to get their hands and even the things that we've noted around these 8,900 errors. The correctness of the posted transactions, first they're saying it wasn't part of the scope to validate if all tolls, credit card payments, and violation fees were correctly populated on those accounts. But they go on to say, while no transaction posting errors were found in the customer accounts, there were several anomalies found regarding BSGL2255. That's back to the deferred revenue again. That's the customer prepaid accounts. We know in December that you all were um, informed of about 100 errors where one customer got charged for not their charge, not their toll, uh, tolling account amount, but somebody else's. So let me explain this because how it was previously explained is not correct. So the best example of this is if I move out of the state and I close my fast track account and now ETAN goes to the tolling goes to charge me. Sometimes it takes a while for the charges, the tolling charges to come through. Well, I've closed my account. I've deactivated my credit card. Somewhere in the system, it said, oh, I can't charge her. Let me go charge them. So another account, meaning them. The good news on this was Sandag and Etan isolated it fairly quickly. It's a small population of accounts and it amounts to $3,300 and those customers have been paid and Sandag and ETAN are not seeing, or HNTB, who was a part of this evaluation, we're not seeing that pattern persist. So the conclusion in section two is the results of this investigation demonstrate many system limitations must be overcome to arrive at a desired level of accuracy, which may or may not be possible. And even if possible, may be cost prohibitive given the level of effort that would need to occur. Our recommendation here is you've already heard that management's continuing to work on it. We're going back to the moving forward recommendation on this. Make sure that that information that is coming from CAPTCHA and the roadway system is being reconciled to what's going into the BOS system on a daily basis to ensure the customer account data is accurate. Section three, finding four. So section three is other reportable matters. These are the things that we found while we were investigating the first two objectives. ETAN's implementation of the back office system was headed for trouble from the beginning. Sandag's executive management failed to address the situation in a timely manner, including informing the board of directors. So these are the events that are lead up to the sole source that you all were presented on January 12th, 2024. In February of 2022, the CFO was assigned to his executive portfolio, the oversight responsibility of SR 125. The CFO contracted Fagan to do a couple reports. The first one was to assess the prior back office system RFP process that actually awarded the contract to ETAN. The other report was to do a risk assessment. On this slide, you'll see a couple things from that actual evaluation of the RFP. First, in relation to the RFP, it was vague, duplicate, or, con or included contradictory requirements. It had untestable requirements and questions about the actual evaluation process and poor system engineering processes applied in developing the RFP. Fagan went on to state, at the time of the Sandag RFP, the winning bidder, who was ETAN, was already experiencing significant financial schedule and development issues on at least one other project. Unfortunately, this concern was not discovered or dismissed. There's several cons that are listed in the report that Fagan reported out in relation to the struggles that ETAN was, happen was, was happening with ETAN. We highlight four points. First, ETAN software development staff is limited. 
a possible single point of failure if that person leaves ETAN. That person left within two months after SR-125 went live. ETAN has limited experience in this type of software development. They've only done two operational back office system projects. ETAN seriously misrepresented the amount of development needed to implement Sandag's system. ETAN responded to the RFP and said that they had basically an off-the-shelf system that was 90% ready. When staff was questioned, staff said, no, it's 90% development, so they're basically building it. And lastly, much of the project and technical documentation, as we've talked about before, is poorly written or non-existent. So back to the timeline. In June of 2022, ETAN turns on SR-125. The data is migrated from the legacy system on June 6, 2022 to ETAN's system on SR-125. In June, members of the executive team are briefed by Fagan on some of the operational risk assessment. In July, the CFO writes this email to Ron Fagan of Fagan Consulting. It was really determined that we need to move away from ETAN, in particular for the new Otay Mesa port of entry, but also in time for SR-125 and I-15. So we need to take an item to our board sooner than later so that we can get the team moving in a direction to prepare a new tolling RFP. This matter was not brought to the board of directors for 16 months until October, 2023, when you all were briefed in closed session. This is text from the sole source justification that has to be prepared in order to award a contract for a sole source. You all were presented on January 12th, 2024 with the request to authorize a sole source to Deloitte and A to B, which you all approved. The conclusion for this section of part three is the reason that Sandag senior management did not address the serious concerns with ETAN's ability to perform sooner was not a part of the scope of this investigation. But it is a matter that should be reviewed in detail by Sandag senior management with the board of directors to ensure matters of this magnitude are handled expeditiously with accountability and transparency at the forefront. Such matters should be presented to the board of directors and the public in a timely manner. Our recommendations here are four recommendations and they are to you all, the board. We recommend that the board and the public should be provided with an explanation as to why an RFP process was not initiated a year sooner and why the board was instead presented with a request to authorize a sole source contract award on January 12th, 2024. We recommend that the board consider a policy that requires a board report when a multi-million dollar project is failing to meet its deadlines and deliverables. We recommend that the board review Sandag's sole source award semi-annual to ensure adherence with public procurement laws and practices. And lastly, we recommend that you request the audit committee and myself that we include this in my work plan for 2024-25 to audit the sole source procurement process at Sandag. The end of section three includes three more findings. We know that Sandag has suffered almost $2 million in revenue losses due to a lack of adequate and timely monitoring. This isn't something we found. This was already uh, Sandag and HNTB were aware of this. They had prepared the, about the calculations on this $2 million. So, and what occurred is the CAP system either did not transmit the tolling information over to ETAN BOS, or they calculated it incorrectly and then transmit it. And that's resulted in the $2 million in revenue losses, almost 2 million. So the conclusion here is we wanna curb revenue late leakage. So Sandag must carefully monitor toll operations daily to identify and address system issues. And this is really about ensuring the recommendation all systems are operating and communicating with each other correctly in relation to toll ops. Another finding is in relation to the missing DMV hold functionality. And at least a million dollars we calculated has been lost due to this function not being turned on in the ETAN system. 
what the DMV hold functionality is. If I am on SR-125, I don't pay my toll. I then get a violation. I continue to not pay it. My violation builds. At a certain point, if this function is turned on, then that file goes over to the DMV. Now I go to register my car. The DMV says, no, you have to pay SANDAG before we will allow you to register your car. We know that Deloitte and Touche is not planning to, uh, to turn this function on until phase two of their implementation. So the recommendation is for SANDAG to evaluate whether they can turn that functionality on sooner. And the last finding, finding seven, is that the investigator, Doug Tabit, who is sitting to my left, he tested a subset of accounts, and he found that the beginning BOS customer account balances no longer match the original balance that was brought over from the legacy system. So again, June 2022, they're testing the system. They're making sure they know what the ending legacy account balances are. They test them. The beginning balances in the ETAN BOS system at the crossover, they're matching. However, when we looked at the subset of accounts, for some reason, those beginning balances don't match. This is about 2% of the accounts in the 62,000 accounts that we looked at. And we gave this to management about a month ago, and they're researching that. So we know that great care in relation to the conclusion must take must be taken with customer account balances. And I know everyone in this room supports that. We recommend that SANDAG implement a daily recommendation reconciliation process, again, back to that reconciling between CAPTCH and ETAN's POS system. And then lastly, establish a process to address customer concerns, both with the errors that are noted, but if there are any if discrepancies in customer balances going forward. The next steps, SANDAG management was provided two weeks from when I released the report. We released the report this past Monday, so they'll provide it. I believe it is on April 8th, that Monday. And then we will publicly report out to the audit committee as well as you all on the recommendations, and we can determine the timing of when you would like those to be brought forward as well as the audit committee. And that concludes my presentation and we're happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to the public, what I wanna do is I wanna have um, the SANDAC team uh, make some comments and then I'm gonna open it up to the public and then uh, we'll, we'll have dialogue as board members. Thank you, um, Chairwoman Vargas, and thank you all for taking time to be here for today's special meeting. Um, I really want to thank the Office of the Independent Auditor for the clarity in the report, the specifics on the recommended actions. And Courtney, specifically within hours of posting the report, set up a meeting to go over all of this in detail so that I was really clear on what was being requested and, and, and Ray and I did that together. So really, really appreciate that. Um, I want you all to know how seriously we take this. When the board of directors approved my contract to be your interim CEO last December, it was at that meeting that you prioritized work on this. In January, we brought an action plan with everything that we knew that needed action, and we are currently implementing all of those actions. There was also a request from OIPA for funding to hire a forensics auditor that was able to help perform this effort. I immediately within my authority signed off on that as well. We've continued to provide updates. One of the priorities underway right now is to hire a finance director. Our HR team knows that that's my number one priority and we wanna have someone in that role within the next 30 days and their priority will be to follow up on the action that you all take today. We see this as very important, extremely serious and we stand ready to dig in and address all of these issues. We've already assembled a team that has started to work on things like, should you take recommendation one and want to have an independent 
entity come in and do a full evaluation of our finance practices. We're looking into right now what we can do under my authority to bring in that independent service and how we can expedite that in a way that is absolutely consistent with your policies and guidance. I will continue to provide updates to you as long as I am in this role. Um, I also wanted to make it clear that the, the, the um, gravity of importance of informing the board early on issues when we see projects maybe going in a direction that was not anticipated. We've heard that from you all, and we're actually working on a policy now that we want to bring back to you. What, what is that threshold? What is that threshold when we make the board aware of a project maybe not meeting the objectives or what has been called for in the scope of work? Um, I also yesterday did um, accept a letter of retirement from our CFO. So um, I'm working with him on a transition plan so that we ensure that the important aspects of what is what needs to be followed up on is, is handled. So I'm working on the staffing plan. It's my number one priority following up with OIPA to ensure all of you and the public that we are on top of this. So those are my initial comments. Um, we will be providing a formal management response as Courtney mentioned on April 8th. So that is in the works. And at your board meeting on April 26th, I will provide you an update on that and where we are in terms of all the recommendations based upon your action today. So thank you again for the professionalism of OIPA and the leadership, Courtney, that you've provided and kept us informed throughout the process, and I very much appreciate that. So I'll turn it back to you, Chairwoman. All right, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to the public. Thank you, Chairwoman. I have two in-person public speakers and three currently virtual. Um, the first two, Truth, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Michael Brando. It's time for Nora to admit that Bill Wells was right. $350 million to buy the toll facility. $167 million loan debt still owed. $1.8 million lost due to junk hardware. $2 million lost due to junk software so far. $1 million lost due to turned off DMV notifications. And $4.2 million to h and who oversaw the screw-up. The toll equipment, it was actually us that disconnected it. We had our team going and taking parts from one place to another. They didn't know that parts weren't working. Public trust has been depleted over the years with Sandag, and we're referred to as idiots. There has been incompetence since 2017 that y'all gave two more contracts to both Eton and h and when everybody knew things were corrupted and broken. Can Sandag only get contracts with agencies that lie? Is that the birds of a feather doctrine? question is why? Who benefited? Because it's more than just Andre. Who is the executive management that hid things from our reps? They need to be correctly charged their toll. Ditch this toll pet project, save tax money, and say, escape while you can't investigate the idiot. Your time has expired. Our next commenter, Michael Brando, will be followed by phone number 415. There's a political environment that we're living in. We're not going to be naive about that. But I'm hoping that today we can be honest and open with each other and really try to put the politics aside. What's important here is that we speak to the facts, that we make sure that the right information is shared with our communities. It takes trust. Trust is earned. It's not something that you just give people. Trust is earned. It's not something that you just give people. Knowledge is power. That we do everything that we can to clear up any myths that are out there about what's happening. That was from March 2023 on different issues, and, and that's beyond your scope, Courtney, because this has to do with stuff that can't be counted. And sometimes things that can't be counted, like with all the mechanics of uh, accounting and auditing, that's what really counts. And again, I'm addressing, addressing the spirit of this organization. I'm addressing the consciousness of this organization. And if you really want to get on the right track, no pun intended, there needs to be some change here. Thank you. Our next commenter, phone number 415, will be followed by the final three commenters. 
Blair Beekman, the original draw, and Samsung. 413, please go ahead. Happy Easter. Thanks for coming in on the holiday. The Office of Independent, excuse me, the Office of Independent Performance Auditor, OIPA, had 10 suggestions for improvement. Uh, first, when she calls for an independent investigation of finance department policies, she's echoing what Mayor Wells and many others have said that the SR2125 toll system was um, mischarging people and broken for six years without a fix. Um, I also would like to compliment uh, Mr. Zito on um, allotting extra time to the speakers at the audit committee meeting and um, possibly he should be sharing this meeting and uh, maybe he'll be a bit more liberal with the speakers. Your time expired and to correct for the record, that was public commenter phone number 415. Our next commenter, Blair Beekman, please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman. Um, Back in 2014, uh, the final few years of the Obama administration, um, uh, and what was, I guess, about the 13th year since the days of 9-11 and continual war, a, a commitment started to grow in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I was originally from, to like address their accounting issues and questions of corruptibility that was happening pretty profusely, you know, because of 9-11, basically, and, uh, and war. And, and they took a real commitment to, to, to work on those issues. And I think uh, Bay Area cities and governments have really worked on that well. I hope you can take lessons from that. And it seems like you're trying to here. And overall, uh, with the recent flood issues, we really got a clean house, so to speak, and make sure our accounting practices are, are in good shape. And we have to address funding, the future of funding accountability from the past and future. Good luck what you're doing here. It sounds like really good work. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> and good luck in this continued good efforts. Um, told Your time expired. The next commenter, the original draw, will be followed by the final commenter, Samsung. The original draw, please go ahead. Lauren is tempted to tell the auditors about all of this, and she was fired immediately. The one with ethical behavior. Where's the justice in that? You fired the wrong account, and the one who did this is still employed. Andre, Andre has demonstrated a lack of performance and negligence. You know, you know. Make it right immediately. If he has any dignity left, Andre would resign out of shame. Sandag should immediately terminate him for lack of performance, unethical behavior, and incompetence. And if they do not, the board is required to act. He lied to the board in December, to the auditor, and was aware of everything and good with everything. He lies almost everything was fixed, which the report confirms is not true. And he continued to tell the board it was not material, which the report also confirms was an inaccurate statement. He's either incompetent or is an intentionally lying, either of which he should be fired for. Lack of adequate inner controls, internal controls, lack of supervision, lack of oversight, lack of monitoring when he had the tools to act. His negligence over the finance department must result in his termination. Since last August, he has taken three vacations, two cruises, and a trip to Hawaii. Yes, all of this while stuff was happening. And even after it was exposed, he still took vacations. Your time expired. Our final commenter, Samsung, please go ahead. Yourself muted. Samsung, are you able to unmute? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to say ditto to everybody that everything, every what everybody else just said. It was, it's very disappointing. It's sad that, um, there were people that were let go and the people that are incompetent are still there, <laughs> but that's government and that's the way it works. And until people start paying attention and um, only one or a few start showing up to these um, smoke and mirror shows, 
that's when we'll see great change and um, progress for everyone. Um, you guys are very concerned about how to deal with people leaving and, you know, going about like things properly, but the, the main issues and the real, like the real, um, what's the word? The real issues, I guess, are not ever addressed. And that's really sad. You guys just care about yourselves. And that concludes the public comments. Thank you. Uh, so first and foremost, I just want to say thank you uh, to board members uh, for agreeing to participate in today's special meeting. I felt it was extremely important uh, once I was able to assess the data. I felt it was important for us to gather today and not wait until our next meeting, which was April 12th. Um, I understand that um, when these investigations are done, uh, management has an opportunity to be you know, respond back uh, within the next two weeks. But for me, it felt that we needed to come together and really hear firsthand from uh, Courtney and the great work that was done um, through her team and knowing that they had also uh, had, you know, we're going to be having a, an audit committee meeting. I want to thank Chair uh, Zito for all the work there and for ensuring that you were very clear about some of the recommendations that the audit committee has made. Um, I um, have a couple of things that I think, you know, I think this is exactly why um, AB 805 was created, right? And why the position of the independent auditor was created so that this uh, type of investigation could take place. And I think all of the members of this board were very concerned about where we were uh, on the issue of the tools last year, which is why we made sure that uh, that was a top priority um, for Courtney and her in her new role. Um, if we, the OPAS conclusions um, that were listed in the findings and the 10 recommendations uh, are exactly what we need to be doing. There's a couple of things that I would like to make sure that are a little bit, that I would like to add. But I think what uh, the report provides is really, I think, um, the next steps for transparency and for accountability, uh, and obviously the extensive concerns that all of us have uh, around the Ethan, uh, Ethan's uh, fast lane uh, system. But I think bigger than that is the issue that all of us are very concerned about and one of our top priorities as board members, which is our fiduciary responsibility for this agency and how uh, resources are, you know, our constituent uh, funding and government, you know, how, how are we actually, um, ensuring uh, that that there's accountability in this process. And it is, uh, you know, we, we want to give people uh, an opportunity to respond, but it is uh, very obvious that there is uh, very systemic breaches, right? I mean, when I hear, when I read in a report that there was executives in the room who knew and who needed to, uh, share information with the board and they made a decision not to, it is very, very troubling for me to hear that firsthand because uh, we are the representatives of these constituents. We are the fiduciary responsibilities of this agency and we need to know. You can never have enough information and that has been my top priority when I became chair, has been my top priority uh, in uh, the conversations uh, with Colleen and her new role. And so to see um, that somehow these decisions are made without sharing uh, with the board it is absolutely unacceptable and inappropriate. And there has to be a shifting in the culture of how that happens. Uh, and I do believe that one of the uh, top priorities, one of the number one recommendations is to ensure that we're doing the assessment of the financial team. But I also wanna make sure that I, that I say this on the record right here, right now, it's not just for the accounting department, for every department that um, the board needs to be made aware when something has an implication at this level. And there is never, never any wavering about what we should or shouldn't know. Those decisions should not be made in a vacuum by, by the executives. Um, we, the executives serve at the pleasure of this board and they also serve as part of 
our public commitment to do the right thing for our communities. And so for me, I want to make sure that that's on the record, that everybody at San Diego is hearing this. And if there is something that we need to know, it's always important that uh, we are informed immediately. I think, you know, SR 125 is an issue that's very close to uh, me because of the work, what it means to my constituents. And you've heard it from uh, council members who represent uh, my district of how, what the impact it has been. There's a lot of issues around equity and to know that the, the system itself is not working and impacting those that need it the most uh, to me is, is just unacceptable. And so um, one of the questions that I had, a couple of questions that I have, um, and I'll open it up to my colleagues as well, is I want to better understand, um, did we figure out who was, who knew and who didn't tell us? Who was in that room? So that's one of the things that we will respond to. I can tell you, for me, I found out that ETAN would not be able to deliver what was needed in October. So that's when I learned whatever decisions were made by executives, I am, you know, that will be part of the response that we prepare and I'm happy to provide that update. Okay. And I think you mentioned that you wanted to respond by April 26. I'm going to ask that, that no. So April 8th is the response okay. that's due to OIPA. Okay. Then your April 26th board meeting, I can provide you an update. If no, you want that gonna, to happen at your April yeah. 12th meeting, yeah. we can do that. I will, it's, uh, you tell me when and we will do it. Okay. Uh, so we need the report back for April 12th and we need to make sure that that's accessible to the public and that people have a chance to read it before as well as uh, the board members as well. The other question I had is, um, um, is there in any of the information that you had, uh, the reason why it wasn't shared with the board was that because, I mean, do you have any? We do not have information why it wasn't shared. Okay. All right. And then uh, when you were, um, when you were looking at, at the work, right. And you were looking at, um, at Ethan, uh, did they, what were their responses to some of this, uh, these findings? So in relation to our conversation with ETAN, it was a part of the investigation. So we would have gone through questions. So everything in, when you're doing an investigation, we substantiate things we go through and it could be interviews, analysis, documents, but we have to have enough evidence in order to put something in the report. Somebody just can't say something. So with ETAN, we went through certain questions. What we've represented in the report is what ETAN told us about the, lack of system documentation. We also know that one of the members of ETAN told us about, um, just escaped my mind, uh, that you would fix one thing and another thing would be broken. So there, that, yeah. they substantiate various things through the report in our, in our questioning. Um, so Chair, if you have a a specific question on what they said, I may be able to answer it more directly or refer back to my notes. Okay. All right. So for purposes of the discussion, I have some other questions, but I want to make sure that my colleagues also have an opportunity to ask questions. So for purposes of the discussion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a motion and then we can now where we can have a discussion and we can adjust the motion uh, as um, needed. But so what I'm interested in making sure that we do is that we accept the, the 10 recommendations as presented um, by our OIPA. Um, but I would like to make sure that it's very clear that the independent assessment of the finance department policies, procedures, and practices to ensure adequate internal controls, including proper review and supervision overall, satisfaction financial operations, that actually that consultant uh, is something that Courtney and her office um, is actually overseeing. Um, I don't think that Sandex should be overseeing who's overseeing their actual uh you know, report. And so um, I would like to have our OIPA folks be able to report back directly to myself and the board um, when we're at, and then let's work together on a timetable. You don't have to put that on the actual, uh, you know, uh, motion, but I do want to make very clear about what I want um, specifically as a response to that. And so I'd like to, um, like I said, make a motion that uh, we accept the 
I think is it simple for me to accept the audit committee's recommendation? Would that be better or do I just create my own? Yeah. So we can go ahead and uh, accept the audit committee's recommendation. I don't, can you put it up? Give me one second. Yeah. Give me. I think they're already in there. No, they're not. They're not in here. Okay. We have three additions. Are you pulling it up? Oh, sorry, yes. yes, please. I'll second. Thank you. You have three. Yeah, for the chair, can I say something? Give me a second. I just want to make sure that they put it up there because they may have some of the information that you need. And if not, you can go ahead and add it. Let's see. I know it's working. Well, that's why I want to put it up there. <laughs> so the action uh, that the uh, that that the audit committee did is that uh, the board of directors accepted the audit committee recommendation to implement the ten recommendations identified in the state route one twenty five toll operations investigation report and to continue the work to confirm customer accounts are accurate, validate with management that no future similar issues identified in the state route one twenty five contract process will occur in future contracts and the development of a policy for timely reporting on a multi-million dollar projects, correct? Yeah, that is correct. I, if it's okay, I'll provide a little bit of additional context around those, just so you hear that. But that was our, those were our three additional recommendations, just one of which is the, you know, if, as you all heard, there were a lot of comments from the OIPA's office about the failure in the RFP process and the failure in the development of the requirements that has contributed to this. And so that directly leads into number two, which is we have already authorized a sole source contract through Deloitte and A to B, and we wanna make sure that, that we go back and that none of those same failures are gonna exist as we move forward with that sole source contract. And the other one was just, uh, uh, just going on and making sure that uh, as we get a dashboard and then we get update to the board that the updates aren't simply just of things that are going wrong. You want to have confirmation that all of the big contracts are being looked at. So similar today, today we get an annual report of um, how all of the audits are audit findings are going. Great. Similar to what you today you get a you get quarterly reports on or more often on how all of the grant awards that we do and how the grantees are performing. We should get a regular report of some sort of, of how how the contracts of the scale decided by the board are performing, whether they're performing well or not. That's the additional context and that's what's in those three recommendations. Thanks. Um, so I wanna say that I appreciate that and I just wanna make sure that we uh, note that one of the requests that I've made uh, from our executive committee in the fall of last year is the project dashboard, right? Where are the projects? Where where are we with the money? How much are we spending? So it's along the lines of this. So that was the request I made last year. I, I think we're supposed to get quarterly reports on where those are, how much are we spending, where are we spending? But in addition to that, if you look at the number three, which is the development of a policy for time reporting on multi-million dollar projects, I think this is only the beginning. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we are very clear that the motion that I'm putting in here uh, does not preclude us from making any additional recommendations once the findings come back from the assessment that's going to be done. Because if I, if you look at other entities that are similar or like us, the amounts of of funding that we are actually uh, that that the executive team is able to just kind of move forward with versus what other agencies or entities at our level uh, are doing is very different. And so I think there's best practices that we're going to hear directly from um, our consultants that will provide additional. So I want to make sure that that it's very clear that this action and this motion is only the beginning because um, there are very clear uh, changes that are going to have to take place. And one of the uh, things that I'm very interested in in the assessment that's going to be done is making sure that the uh, there has to be some assessment that our next CEO will have to make about the organizational structure of our executive team and the recommendations of, of who reports to whom and how that moves as we're, as we're moving forward. But I do think that that's something that as we hire the next CEO, they, they have to have the responsibility of being very clear uh, about some of that. And so with that, I'm going to open it up to uh, Council Member uh, Vivian Moreno. Um, 
Thank you for the report. And um, I agree with all the findings and recommendations um, in this investigation. Uh, I do want to thank our independent auditor, Ms. Courtney Ruby, and, and her whole staff uh, for an excellent and timely report. Uh, given that we're still waiting for the formal management response to this investigation, I would like to use my time today to try to clarify some facts for the record. Uh, page 17 of the audit states, quote, in June 2022, Fagan briefed and recommended to members of the Sandag Senior Executive Management to begin researching alternative procurement options due to significant concerns with E10, end quote. My question is, which members of the senior executive management team attended that meeting and received the briefing from Fagan? Thank you, board member. The members I know are the CFO and the CEO. I don't know if other members of the executive team were present. Okay, and who, who were they at the time? That would be uh, the CEO, Hassan Akrata, and the CFO, Andre. And those were the only two people that you know that were in those that meeting? Those are what I can confirm. I don't, there could have been other members, but I'm not, I can't confirm that. Your audit didn't show that. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, our interim CEO, Colleen Clementson, um, stated at the audit committee meeting on March 26th, and I quote, in my role as deputy CEO, I became aware that E10 couldn't perform what we were asking them to perform in October. We had a meeting with the board to, no to notify them of that, end quote. My question is, if Fagan briefed members of the senior executive management team in June 2022, why did it take until October 2023 to become, for us to become aware of this problem? That is an excellent question, and it is one that, as we state in the report, is not in the, we did not evaluate that. That does um, need to be answered, um, but it is not documented in the investigation. We don't have that answer. Thank you. HNTB, the technical advisor for this project, addressed a letter to the interim CEO on February 8th of this year. This letter stated that, and I quote, as of July 2022, HNTB notified staff at multiple levels, including the CFO and staff reporting to the deputy CEO, that we would no longer recommend E10's invoice for approval and would no longer be willing to co-sign future invoices based on E10's contractual non-compliance. We specified that any approval of invoice would therefore be at the agency's discretion and would have to be singularly approved by Sandag, end quote. Is this true? Were the CFO and the deputy CEO notified of this by HNTB in July 2022? I'm not aware whether they were notified or not. There was not a contract change to document that statement. I do know that. Okay. And who made the decision to continue approving ETAN's e -voice, invoice, I'm sorry, even though HNTB refused to do so? Uh, uh, and when, when, and when was this decision made? That would be a, a question for management. Page 18 of the audit states, and I quote, senior management did not take an item to the board of directors until October 2023, almost 16 months after Fagan's June 2022 briefing. My question is why, why the delay? That too would be a question for management. I was concerned at our January meeting about the rush nature of the sole source contract that was brought to this board for approval. This, investiga and this investigation shows that my concerns were justified. Management had plenty of time to complete a competitive procurement, but chose not to. My hope is that the written management response will offer a complete explanation for this 16 month delay. Moving on to the next steps, Public Audit Committee member Agnes Wong Nickerson brought up at the meeting on Tuesday that Sandag is asking Deloitte to deliver a functioning back office system in seven months when ETAN and Sandag couldn't do it in four and a half years. 
Why should the board and the public have confidence in this agency's ability to stand up this system in seven months? The that as well is a great question. What I do know, and I just want to to state that the the range that has been put out public is seven to ten months. Um, so I just want to make sure that that is on the record, and I think that management that again is a question that they need to provide that answer to you. Thank you. Um, I believe that a similar answer uh, was given in the audit committee, where Mr. Major stated that he was hopeful. Um, that including the 125 into the project management office uh, will improve things. I will note, however, that at the April 22nd, 2022 board meeting, Mr. Major stated that the replacement of the tolling system was already part of the project management office. So I'm not sure what the project management office can do now um, that it hasn't done for the past two years. Um, I believe that um, until this organization shows that it has held all board parties that were responsible for this mess accountable, the public will not have confidence in the ability of Sandag to manage the 125. I reiterate my call for Sandag to immediately begin work on the environmental document and the MOU with Caltrans that are necessary to remove the tolls from the 125. Furthermore, this report raises real questions about Sandag's business operation, aside from the issues with the 125. First, it raises issues with procurement. Clearly, ETAN should have never been selected in the RFP process. I wanna know why the selection team failed to perform due diligence and why they thought ETAN was the best contractor. The audit also found that there were problems with the RFP from the beginning suggestions that our entire suggesting that our entire procurement process needs to be examined and fixed to prevent similar problems from happening again second as recommendation one indicates it seems we have major issues with financial procurements and operations throughout this whole agency the failure of sandag management to take any steps to address these problems with the sense of urgency is very concerning and it raises questions about what other financial problems um, in this in this agency what other financial problems might exist that are not being addressed adequately um, finally, I think this audit, as well as the answers to my questions today, raise major concerns about the honesty of our executive team statement to the board. Let me say this very, very clearly. It is unacceptable for management to keep information from the board and information that the board should know about. It is also unacceptable to mislead this board when answering questions about important issues. I do remain committed in finding out the whole truth about this issue and also holding part of the parties accountable for this. Um, you know, I take my responsibility as a, an elected official very, very seriously. This absolutely impacts um, my community. It impacts the business community um, in my region, but it also impacts the credibility of this agency. And that's something that I do not take lightly. Um, and with that, Chair, thank you for the extra time. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Kearns. Yes, yeah, so um, since the release of the report, I've been dragging my jaw around, um, uh, just, just dumbstruck by um, the information that was presented and the incompetency that it uh, reveals. Um, and so, you know, trying to um, decide how to approach this problem uh, has been a challenge. Um, going, but upon reflection, I realized that the whole issue of the 125 has been controversial from the beginning. The private company that developed it went bankrupt. I know that uh, at the time, Sandag was considering acquisition of it. Uh, Jerome, Strock, Jerome Stocks, the mayor of Encinitas, was the chair of the Sandag board. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to fault the decision of the board back then, but um, the way this has played out is has really given this agency a, a couple black eyes. Um, 
I, I agree with Council Member Moreno that the questions that surround decisions that were made by upper management at this organization um, are um, you know they're suspect and um, how deep it goes and who should be relieved of their responsibilities is is just not clear to me um, but I asked uh, back in December at our meeting, um, the CEO at the time, how it was that the board was not informed sooner, and he responded, and it's the quote is in the report. His response was, you hire your staff to do their job, and we were doing our jobs, and we knew there were issues. Yeah, we knew there were some operational issues, but we thought the best approach is to overcome the mantle to get to the point where we couldn't get the financial statement. That's when we came to you in October. But yes, I made those decisions based on the authorities you offer me to make. And I don't think you want every time we have an operate small operational issue. Um, you know, the, it's just incomprehensible that somebody could think that what we were dealing with at the time was a small operational issue or even three years earlier. Um, but it is critical that we make clear to the next CEO that uh, he does not have the authority to decide to withhold this sort of information from the board. Um, I, I also want to make sure that um, item two doesn't, isn't looking specifically or exclusively at the issue of the sole sourcing. I think that this board had little choice but to hire the sole source uh, vendors only because of the mistake of not bringing it to the board 16 months earlier. Mm -hmm. So, but what I also wanna make sure number two addresses is the issue that Council Member Moreno raised, which is the RFP process this agency undertakes. Reading this report, seeing that ETAN was using QuickBooks was just, really shocking to me, um, this notion that they had some off-the-shelf solutions and anybody in a procurement process could think that that was appropriate for the job that was necessary to be done, dealing with um, taxpayers' money, road users' money. Um, our fiduciary obligation as an agency um, was compromised by the decision to hire a company that was going to approach this problem with that uh, uh, with those solutions. So how it was that they were selected is, is to me probably the most important issue. And so the incompetence that was involved in hiring them is a question that I think we need to explore whether, you know, there's criminality involved here. How does somebody so incapable of producing this, who I was identified early on as being incapable of providing this software and the, yet they were continued. We we paid them time and time again. We paid them time and time again when we had experts telling us we can't we can't um, you know sign off on your invoice. It's it just raises some really critical issues having to do with credibility of this organization. And uh, I think it's important that we once again explore our legal options in order to um, hold accountable the people that were involved in this disaster. So um, I know that uh, we've talked about this. I think our original meeting was in closed session in order to um, identify, you know, what the right approach was with these vendors. And, and uh, um, you know, part of it was part of the discussion. I mean, it doesn't necessarily relate to the closed session, but everyone knows that legally clawing back um, ill-gotten gains is, is, is a challenge, but I think that it's something we need to revisit uh, sooner rather than later because um, this notion that, that this level of incompetence can be written off is just really bothersome to me. And then finally, you know, I, my, my former colleague, um, Mayor Blakespear was the chair here and she was preceded by 
um, Mayor Voss. I wonder, Mayor Voss, if, if you have any recollection when you were the chair of conversations about the failure of ETAM. And, and it was it possible that this was not discussed with elected officials, leaders of this organization for such a long period of time? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. And, you know, I served as a chair of North County Transit District during a really critical time. Uh, we were trying to expand service of the coaster. I had um, some very uncomfortable interactions with Hassan. I know he could be uh, very difficult to deal with. I had a really tense Zoom meeting when he was withholding funding for our expansion of service. He had his team around him during that Zoom meeting. Um, it came across as a, a power play that was um, pretty disgusting from where I sat. And uh, I understand that the culture of the organization went through um, some difficult times with him at the helm of this organization. In December, when I asked that question of him and he gave me that BS answer, um, I knew he was on his way out the door. And I was very thankful for that. And all I can say is that um, as long as I continue to have the opportunity to serve my constituents at this agency, um, I'm going to do my best to hold um, the organization accountable. So um, I do request that we have a closed session as soon as possible to consider um, legal um, avenues to recover some of the costs. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Chavez. Thank you so much, Chair. Well, this was an extremely concerning report to receive. Um, First, I want to. I would like to extend my gratitude to Courtney and her team for their comprehensive investigation, and to the chair and the CEO for calling us to this immediate meeting as soon as it was possible. Transparency is the cornerstone of our community's trust in the commitments we make as an organization. Unfortunately, it has been the absence of such transparency that allowed us this issue surrounding the SR-125 to escalate beyond our control. And, and it hurts me and it pains me to say, but the South Bay, the South Bay constituents are the ones who are most deeply impacted. From the onset, the tolling system has faced numerous challenges. In February of 2022, Fagan and Consulting highlighted in their assessment as documented on page 18, on the OIPA report that the RFB selecting ETAN contained untestable requirements. And ETAN was already experiencing significant financial schedule and development issues on at least one other project. Fagan advised issuing a new RFP for the toll services. Yet 16 months later, the board was presented with a sole source proposal rather than a new RFP, opting for a less transparent and open option, particularly concerning given the lack of due dil dil diligence uh, selecting Eaton. Furthermore, during a presentation at our South Bay workshop that we had here at the Sandek facilities and at the Chula Vista uh, Chamber, uh, sorry, the Chula Vista City Council, I inquired whether the revenues uh, from SR-125 and the I-15 were kept separate. Sandag staff reassured us that the 6436 revenue split was precise and ensured proportional payments. However, as page nine of the OIPA report reveals, when requested, no documentation could be provided to support how the allocation percentage was determined. This lack of transparency not only obstructs the proper management of customer accounts as detailed throughout the report, but also impairs our board's ability to effectively discuss and manage this crucial road roadway. I support the OIPA report recommendation and assert that the technical issues and lack of transparency highlight the need to eliminate the SR-125 toll as soon as feasible. Continuing to extend the bond retirement date beyond 2027, as I have been mentioning the last couple of meetings, due to inadequate financial record, keeping of money already paid by users is just unjust. Continuing to fund the flawed tolling system is not only a misuse of resource, 
but also a disservice to the public trust. The most effective way to rebuild trust in Sandeg is by upholding our promises to the community and de delivering a toll-free SR-125. I support the motion and action that is recommended today, but I would like to make a motion to require staff return with budget options to retire the SR-125 debt by 2027 before the end of the fiscal year, that is in June 2024. So um, at this time, as a maker of the motion, I, I, I want to just kind of clarify because that motion we've already made during the, that has already been a request. So I think if it would be okay with you, council member, to put it on the record that you're requesting what the status of it is, because that motion has been made. So can you follow up and let her know when or where we're at with that? Of course. Yes. So, so yeah. we do have it agendized before the end of the fiscal year, and I can get you the date. Yeah, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So I think to your point, it absolutely important. I just want to make sure that that uh, not accepting it into the action doesn't mean that I don't support it. It just means that that request has already been made and it's a, there is a report back to the board. Um, so let me figure out if we can do that sooner than the end of the year because the end of the year is still far away. So, okay. Yeah. Fiscal year. Fiscal year. Oh, so it's fiscal in June. Year. Sorry. Before, before June. Yes. It's yes. Before, yes. 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 Okay. 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 So we're good? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. Uh, Council Member Molina. Thank you very much, Chair Vargas. Uh, I appreciate your motion and uh, especially uh, Board Member Moreno's comments about the failures here. This is a very serious matter. Uh, I do see that it is being handled in a very serious manner. So for that, I am thankful. Uh, I appreciate Ms. Ruby's uh, mention of materiality. I think that concept is um, very helpful uh, in the scope of what an invest this type of investigation and and what you know what our focus should be. Uh, and I do have comments. I, I do have a question about the lost revenue. But first, I do want to add the uh, importance of this cultural change, and many members here have already made a comment about the culture, and uh, I, I see that this is a great opportunity to invite this type of cultural change. It is very concerning that a public agency is not being, is not taking the opportunity to be forthcoming with information. And if this is the, you know, this is not the first time Sandag has made this mistake. It, that's the most appalling to me is we've been in this, not me, I was not on the board at the time, but uh, there are members on staff who were in this very exact position where information had not been forthcoming. And here we are again, and I don't understand it, but I'm calling on this cultural change that Chair Vargas has uh, highlighted because this is the time to do so. There is new leadership. There is a new makeup of this board. This is the time to begin righting the wrongs. And if it hasn't happened yet, it should by now be happening now. Um, I also want to say uh, to me something that was very important that Ms. Ruby mentioned is that the finance staff saw concerns with the uh, financial matter in all of this within one month of the operation, within one month of the start of the operation from ETAM. Uh, this was seen from the very beginning. Somehow it was allowed to bubble up and became $2 million lost in revenue plus another million. Uh, so I sort of wonder, it's like, what would have happened, you know, had very early on, had the right actions been taken? You know, perhaps this incredible loss wouldn't be so great. And so my question about the $2 million revenue loss, um, I'm still not very clear about this revenue loss. So I understand this was a software transfer from the uh, CAPTCHA system when drivers are going through the lanes, and then it didn't transfer over to ETAN and, and the the, um, that number is $2 million loss. My question is, Is were drivers, were um, customers uh, charged an amount that, you know, in, a, in, in total became $2 million, or that money just was never charged? 
It is lost revenue. So that means it was not charged. It was not recorded. It is gone. So drivers essentially were not charged. They used the Correct. land for free. Correct. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn over to my colleagues, one thing that I failed to ask, uh, um, just because I want to make sure that it's on the record, can you tell me what the mechanics are now for uh, whistleblowers and or anyone who has information that wants to share with the board? So if there's a whistleblower that wants to reach out so that you can go to Sandag backslash OIPA, and my email address is on the landing page. You can direct a message right to me. You can go down further on the page and you'll see the whistleblower information. There's a whistleblower form. You can provide it anonymously, mail it in. You do not have to give us your name in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and you will see in the coming months, the whistleblower program that we will put more attention around that. We plan on going to every department, explaining it so that every employee is aware because the employees are on the front lines they know what's working and not working. Okay. Um, and the reason why I ask that, so in the County of San Diego, we have an Office of Ethics and Compliance, and I'm interested in moving forward with creating such an office as part of SANDAG's um, department. So I'm, I, I'm not sure if it goes in this action or is it something that I would have to ask for separately. I just want to make sure that we follow you know, the process accordingly. But I do think that there has to be, um, there's definitely, culture shift doesn't happen overnight. And even with a new CEO, um, that won't take place. I want to make sure that that staff is assured that, you know, uh, coming directly to the board and, you know, having an actual uh, office of ethics and compliance uh, would be, I think, the one of the directions that we as a board should really focus on. I don't know if you have any... The only the comment I would make is I my experience is always to operate a formal whistleblower program. So Absolutely. that's what we have Absolutely. every intention of doing. So and people can be assured that they can report things through their computers and we can't trace them. So there's this level of formality that occurs with that. And then we can discuss if the ethics and compliance is something that you want included in that or you want that separate and um, just uh, I will support you all in that discussion and bringing forth different models. Yeah. I don't think it has to be either or. I think it has to be both um, because one is a, a, a place where people can actually provide information and the other one is the commitment that this agency has to ensure that everyone uh, who works for SANDAG has a contract with SANDAG uh, is on the board of SANDAG understands, and it's not just a document that we fill out mm -hmm. every year as board members or as staff, but that this is the culture of the agency, one where ethics and compliance are key to how we manage um, this agency and this organization. And I think that we're at that space where it's not happening happening naturally based on what we are hearing. And so I want to make sure that it's um, institutionalized as well. Okay, uh, Mayor Jones. Eric, can I just... Oh, yes, ma'am. One other thing. We have also, in, in my past roles, we have um, initiated an ethical climate survey to the employees. And that brings a lot of useful information back to the board. And it also starts to... Um, make the employees aware of the processes and the importance that the governing board is placing on ethics. Uh, let's figure out how we include that in, in that process. Uh, Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, so our OIPA said today that uh, these issues that we have been brought to our attention in her investigation need to be corrected and that so that they cannot happen again. We do, however, also need some accountability here, and I don't think we're really talking enough about that. To be honest, I'm, in board, I'm embarrassed as a board member that here we are yet again with um, a further, um, further issues being brought to our attention where we literally have um, information that hasn't been given to us. And to really find out the depth of what that actually actual information is, you know, ETAN should have never been um, ever hired as, and even, I mean, there's no, there's no scaling, there's no grading, there's no 
information as to how they were actually selected as part of the process and how they actually won the contract. So that to me is a real issue. Um, kind of going back to our January report of this year, um, it states specifically the HNTB has all of these different um, uh, things that they're supposed to be doing when they're when they're managing it. There's been like zero discussion about HNTB and their role of failure here which is very concerning to me. Um, you know, they're, they're supposed to be our project manager. They're supposed to provide technical support and advice. They're supposed to actually test and approve, re test, review, and approve. It, it, it sounds like, based on the, um, uh, the auditor's investigation, that we were doing a lot of that. So we, we, we spent, oh, how much was it? Um, I want to say, so I have this number somewhere. Oh, $17.7 .7 million dollars on ETAN, HNTB, and then also Fagan uh, moving forward to figure out why this all failed. My God, like, do, do we just, does money grow on trees? Because I don't think it does. And I mean, I, I find this to be so offensive, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, but there's no mention of actually why th they haven't done what they were supposed to do, really. And 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 I find that very, very disturbing. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, in, based on the timeline that we saw in January, the liquidated damages started in 2018. This leads me to believe that we already know and our legal counsel already knew that we are having issues. Um, the, the, the contract was approved in 2016, December. Uh, the contract was awarded in March of 2017. In October of 2018, it was planned to go live. And, uh, new, um, and then we started again, like I said, liquidated damages in October of 2018. We never went live in 2020, I'm sorry, uh, 2018. Then the I-15, which we haven't even discussed today, we already, we, we already know that if there are problems with 125, they must be happening on the 15 because we have the very same system as far as I, I believe. Anyway, in November of 2020, uh, the I-15 went live. May of 22, the um, SR-125 went live, okay? So looking through all of the, the information that we have, and by the way, I think that uh, Council Member Moreno had some great questions. I would like those um, documented and then sent out to the entire, the answers to those to the entire board, because I believe that we need that information. Because here we are, we're making decisions on faulty information, hidden information, and how can we do that? We're supposed to be the policy advisors that are accountable to uh, the residents, and, and you had mentioned that a little bit earlier. How can we be accountable when we don't even have the actual information? Uh, so anyway, I, I'm concerned about when our liquidated damages started, who knew what? Really, who knew what in all of this? And who can, who can, who can we actually hold accountable? I am concerned that we have 19 agencies that we rely on our attorney to actually give us this information. Board leadership was uh, briefed by staff. Our OIPA has subpoena powers. Um, you and I had spoken about this uh, the other day, Courtney. Um, I said, "Well, who were part of these? Who were part of these meetings?" There must be calendars that actually prove this. She suggested that I do a public records request. I would ask you publicly, Courtney, to please use your subpoena powers because I believe it's somewhere in um, AB 805. I can look it up. I, I looked over it this morning and it looks like you do have subpoena powers. I want to know who was in, who were in all of those meetings and who, if our attorney kept things from us. And I, I'm sorry, Mr. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Kirk. I don't know if it was you or any of your staff, anybody in our, our uh, legal defense. We need to know who was involved and, and why we were not given this information. And we need accountability. Mayor, can, so, you, can you clarify yes. something for me? Did you say sure. executive leadership or board leadership? Both, actually. The board leadership, I believe, probably knew, and our executive leadership probably knew. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not the, saying uh, you specifically. Okay. I'd like to, so I actually have a substitute motion. So my substitute motion is to include everything that you have there, um, and also to include um, that our SANDAG counsel and others in his office, whether our SANDAG counsel and, and others in his office and board leadership were made aware any time um, July 22nd or before 
if if because it wasn't actually brought to the board um, and and we weren't notified. So were were there people that should have told us what was going on before, including our um, our attorney? Because again, you know, we can't make we're, we're making decisions on so much money, and if we are not properly informed and we don't know what's going on, it's it's a problem for me. So I think. Maybe it would be that you would be able to do your subpoena powers, um, um, Courtney, and we would be able to find out was was our legal team, anyone in our legal team informed ahead of time and we weren't um, informed. Was there were there any board leadership? I'm not talking about you specifically, but I, I'm just saying um, anyone uh, that was informed prior to um, us finding out. And um, and then also our executive team, whether they were informed and didn't notify us. Because again, I mean, we did talk about the whistleblower, as a matter of fact, the other day when we were uh, speaking, um, we do need a whistleblower, but you're already moving forward, so it doesn't need to be part of the motion. My motion would be to include whether our Sandag Council and anyone in that office and, and our board leadership <clears throat> as well as who was involved with our um, our um, our actual executive team, because everyone's blaming Hassan. It's pretty easy to do that when he's not here. Who else was involved? Who else knew? Who else did not uh, provide us the right information so that we could actually um, make an informed decision on everything that we have? So are you asking oh. for an independent investigation yes. of that? Yes, I am. Okay, yes. in that case, I would second it. Okay. Okay. So you want an an additional? So let me ask, uh, Courtney, was that part of your assessment? It was not. <clears throat> so the objectives of the investigation are put forth and to look at the accounting matters to report back on the errors, and then we have the other reportable matters, which we brought to your attention in relation to the board not being informed. It was not to identify what Mayor Jones is saying. So I think the the. Part of the question is the, the systemic break, breakdown, which is what supervisor, I'm supervisor, council member. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, no, council member Moreno was also addressing, and I think it has been addressed by every person that has spoken so far. And so I'm happy to amend my motion so that we can just include it as part of the action. I can add it to my um, I can add it to my motion. Well, would that be for an independent investigation of who? That's what, what she's asking. Yeah. So I'm okay. happy to add it to, yeah. to the actual motion. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be it'd be the executive team, the um, uh, the board leadership, and then also our. I would say the board, not just the yeah, board leadership. For sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. If, if, if we if we received a briefing from. Um, uh, everyone that knew and we were given information absolutely and and this can easily be found through calendars i mean that's what i was actually talking with courtney about there's got to be calendars that actually um you know we'd be able to go back to and look at so sure. um i think it's also uh important and that... i think teams meetings i think i i think um i think sandeg uses a lot of teams meetings yeah yeah, yeah. so i think um uh, to your point that those responses should be part of also management's response by the April 8th. Deadline. Yes, including yeah. our, our attorney's office, because again, back to the point of our, our we have we have 19 agencies here. I, I have there have been times and nothing against you, Mr. Kirk, but there have been times where I don't feel like our agencies are all uh, being represented fairly as sometimes I felt like and, you know, like in, in our city, I'm sure all of your cities are the same. Our, we, we as a board, as a council, have two employees, and that is our attorney and our and our manager. That's it. So that would be Colleen and then also uh, Mr. Kirk. So in, in that little um, uh, information, and, and it actually did come out in one of the audits. I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it, it showed that the structure didn't seem to be correct. There was a dot going from the attorney not to the board, I think it was actually to the executive director, which I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like you're here to represent us. We're making the decisions. We're the ones that need the representation because all of our agencies need to feel like they're uh, represented. Our organization chart will show that I have a line both to the chief executive officer and to the board of directors. So the agency though is, so I, I mean, we, has has anyone ever sat down with our general counsel and 
said, you know, like, have we ever had these meetings? I feel like there should be meetings. I mean, we we meet pretty routinely with our um, our city attorney, just so that we know we're all on the same page. We get like an update on things. I, I don't know that I, I've ever received anything like that. I highly encourage anyone who would like to meet with our legal counsel to go ahead and do that directly. I, I, I think and I think that part of the conversations that we've had, and I don't want to deviate from this component because I think it's really important and your, your points are absolutely well taken. But um, having served on Cal Sturs, right, the Teacher Retirement Board, we had, what, $298 billion uh, while I was on that board. We had an audit committee, and then we had not only our attorneys, but we also had the independent attorneys that advised um, um, our uh, our board of about 11 or 12 people, and in addition to the consultants that worked for us directly as board members in addition. So I'm not trying to add additional uh, layers, but uh, what I want to share is that there are mechanisms in place that boards, this is a very unique entity. And so as was AB 805 created to include an independent auditor, I think as we have our new uh, CEO, those are the kinds of recommendations that I think that we should be making and saying, thinking about the bigger picture, about what are the other uh, mechanisms or systems that need to be in place. Because in the end, the mission of SANDAG is one that actually is what we're all here for, which is ensuring that our communities are able to get to where they need to go. Funding is adequately um, shared with our communities and many of the local cities who are here would not be able to receive the funding that they get if it wasn't for the work that we do together. So. I think there's some mechanisms that we can actually, as we're moving forward, really share. Um, and I think great questions uh, for also the person competing for the CEO position as we move forward. Is there anything else, um, Mayor? No, no, that would be it. So, and okay. and then the independent, so it's an independent investigation and the um, our OIPA would be able to use her subpoena powers if it's necessary. Well, no, just her subpoena powers to get the information for the independent investigation. So it has to be an, in, an, an independent investigation. Do you think that they would be able to get the information properly? I just want to make sure that I, I, when there's no, her, no withholding of, of calendars. Like, that's really important to me. I have access to all information in my role. Okay, so you, would my work, powers. so you would be able to give the information for the independent investigator. So you're saying you don't want OIPA to... You don't want me as the investigator and my team to perform it. Well, I'm. I'm. What were you? What well, were you what saying? Are you I, we have I, at the pleasure of the board. It seems to me that I think Courtney has demonstrated that her office has the ability to do an independent assessment. Um, the independent assessment that she did was exactly what we had asked her to do. So this is sort of the second phase to, to okay. the second step. And I think it's fair to say, could you please go ahead and do it, uh, take it a step further and do this independent assessment um, specifically to what uh, the mayor uh, has requested and I think you have a capability to do that correct we do I do yes. have one clarifying question do you have the time for it I, that's, <laughs> that's really honestly one of my biggest concerns whether you have the time for it Mayor Jones what I'm hearing is a very specific request yeah so that's what and and when we do investigations they are designed to answer the question so um based on the request I believe that we are going we do have the time to fulfill that request okay Thank right. you. Great. Thank you. Wonderful advice, too. By the way, I do uh, agree to that amendment. I'm sorry? I do agree to the amendment. Thank you, oh, sir. Yeah, I so appreciate the process <laughs> clarification. Yes, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And um, thank you very much, Ms. Ruby, for all of the work you did. Um, it's quite impressive that you are, and your team were able to pull all this together and answer quite a, a number of the questions that we have, although, as we've heard today, there are quite a few unanswered questions. I think this, uh, the seriousness of this um, has been underscored by everyone who has spoken, the critical nature of this to our reputation, to um, you know the trust that we require of the public to put in us, which has been harmed by this and other um, audits, this investigation and other audits. Uh, this has to be um, corrected. And I think that we're on the, the right uh, track to do that. And I do want to acknowledge our chair. I, I think that with her background and experience, she is 
uniquely qualified to be here at this time and put in place um, all of the recommendations that she has, including um, bringing us together today and immediately responding um, and allowing us to um, add to the investigative work that will be ongoing. Um, because again, this is a very serious thing. Um, I have a couple of questions um, that haven't been answered. And, and, and that is, it seems to me that Eton was just absolutely not ready to go live and it was clear that they weren't ready to go live. So who made the decision to go live? And was the issuance of bonds, did that have anything to do with that decision to go live clearly before there was um, you know, a, um, a sound system set up? Do you have that information now? What we have in the report is that at the, the decision point, it was decided that they did not want to del delay. So that was one of the risks they identified, right? ETAM was already 30 months behind, but felt that the delay would impair CAPTCH. So they chose to reduce functionality in ETAM in order to meet that. And then another risk that we note there is, right, they were concerned about ETAN's performance, they meaning SANDAG. So to mitigate that risk, it would have been to increase monitoring. Immediately, we say in the report, ETAN and SANDAG did not yeah. understand the level of performance issues that they would be faced. So there's a tracking system that tracks performance issues that both ETAN, uh, excuse me, SANDAG Finance and SANDAG Toll Ops were reporting internal work tickets from 22 to 23 the work tickets doubled and went up to 1200 there's a cumulative chart in the report that shows you each year the number of tickets they're putting in and then you see it double it just seems to me it was a pretty bad decision <laughs> to to go live with um, a system that just wasn't working and it's just compounded ever since i too was shocked to see the phrase quickbooks in in, in here my thought had always been that etan was creating this unique system for our unique needs and you know only they could do it or they were chosen to do it because they had the skills and the you know the talent to do it and clearly that's not the case um so that's quite frustrating can um, i make a point a, another thing i just like on that yeah Please, yes, correct me. Sandak used QuickBooks for the tolling to produce the tolling financial statements. ETAN did not use QuickBooks. ETAN's fast lane tolling system, their general ledger was that's where you see all the problems occurring. So the expectation would have been that ETAN's general ledger would have worked and then QuickBooks would have been removed. So it was a path. Sandak had to continue using. using QuickBooks in order to issue the financial statements. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they could have used something else, I'm not, I'm just saying, but what Sandag was the one who was employing QuickBooks. ETAN, when we talk about their general ledger, we you'll hear the word fast lane. That's their accounting system. And QuickBooks would not have needed to be in the mix had ETAN's system fully worked and integrated well, better with the CAP system and um, our internal um, general ledger, but I guess we used QuickBooks for our general ledger. My, my understanding is that QuickBooks, when we purchased SBX, is that right? The South Bay, yeah, right? SBX, Express, yeah. When we purchased that, that's how that system was being maintained was QuickBooks. So I think that Sandag continued the process. Got it. Okay. And that brings me kind of to my next point, And that is, you know, um, and this, this, this um, speaks to what has come up in our board retreat and other discussions. And, and that is that the board needs to know the thought process behind decisions that are made. I was on the board way back when we purchased this. And the thought then, as I've mentioned before, was that we could take transit funds, which were identified for expanding HOV lanes on 805 and use that um, as as funding for this, and um, and then we would have bondholders, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, maybe that's a little bit of mission creep. Maybe this agency should be looking at what exactly is the scope of our authority. I mean, should we really be an agency operating a toll road, or you know, uh, should we not have thought differently of that? And is there um, something to put in place to kind of recognize what is our job and what is not our job because this 
my this has just been a mess um, kind of from the beginning. So um, and then I also had questions about HNTB, like they're supposedly, you know, the way I would look at it is the owner's eyes, because I know a lot of people in the construction contracting world who will hire an owner's eyes person. Should that owner's eyes organization be reporting to you know, the board maybe, or, or is there some other place to be reporting maybe would have known these problems uh, at the board level sooner. So um, just a couple of, of um, thoughts there. And then my final is, um, you know, we've got these bonds that we have outstanding on this and we can't, we, uh, I don't know how much bond coverage we have. I don't know what all of this means to, to the bonds, to our ratings, to our, um, in the future to the actual payment of these bonds? Um, is, is there a part of the fix? How are we going to make all of this right? Um, and maybe that can be included in some of your responses is how do the how does the whole bond situation fit into the problems that we're identifying and or um, if they're involved in any of the solutions that we um, might, like it's been suggested that we not pay the, if we just open it up to be a free road. I don't think that that could occur because then we wouldn't have revenue to um, fund our bonds and make our bond payments. So I'm just curious how all of that fits into the big picture that you're going to eventually present to us. Should that be a response for management? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Vasquez, did you paint cover for kind of question? I'm sorry. I can't tell whether I'm back in the queue. We have one question. Yeah. We have a whole bunch of folks on the queue. So I'm trying. I got you. Uh, it's Mayor Raquel Vasquez. I did. I'm sorry. I, I, I corrected it at the wrong time. Sorry. Yes. And um, I'll say this truth, transparency, Minimizing risk to build public trust. Office of the Independent Performance Auditor, thank you for the work that you do in support of these fundamental values. We know that this issue is critical and addressing the tolling in financial accounting issues, that may present some obstacles for SANDAG and OIPA, but we know that it is imperative that we act swiftly to rectify the issues to uphold the integrity of SANDAG and system operations. After reviewing the report and a follow-up meeting um, yesterday with the independent performance auditor, and we actually had some challenges, but we got through those, it became very apparent to me that accuracy, transparency and accountability are paramount in ensuring the integrity of the tolling system. For example, the report revealed challenges in implementing the ETAN's back office tolling system, um, which were not properly addressed by executive staff or communicated to us, the board. Um, and this lack of transparency and delay in addressing concerns must be addressed to prevent similar occurrences in the future. Additionally, the investigation highlighted significant revenue losses um, due to errors in the roadway system and the failure to activate certain functions within ETAN's BOS. The financial discrepancies underscore the importance of a robust monitoring and internal control system to ensure accurate billing and to prevent revenue loss. And it is important if we want to minimize risk for this organization and to keep SANDAG moving forward that regular audits and transparent reporting those things are essential in effectively managing the state route 125 tolling system. By prioritizing truth, transparency, and regular audits, we can uphold the highest standards of accountability in SANDAG operations, minimizing risk and restoring public trust. So, you know, I support the motion that we have along with the changes that have been made to the original motion. I just have one question. And my one question is, why was the DMV hold not operational? I'd like to know the reason. 
Thank you, Mayor. I'm actually gonna turn to the other investigator on this to talk about, the mayor and I talked about that last night. And when the mayor talks about challenges, it was tech, we had technology challenges. We didn't have to challenges. <laughs> so um, I am gonna have uh, Doug DePete talk about the functionality. Can you state your question one more time, Mayor? Yes, why was the DMV hold not operational? I'd like to know the reason. Sure, um, we've been told that uh, it was not working and that it also wasn't turned on. There's a little confusion from staff on either it was not working or they just didn't turn it on. Uh, can we get clarification on um, what the real reason was um, when we received the report? We're happy to clarify that. Anything else, Mayor? That completes my uh, comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilmember Duncan. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your report and especially uh, how quickly it seems to me that it was prepared and handled and the committee and everyone's efforts. I do appreciate it. I do have a, uh, I'm not gonna repeat all the other comments of the fellow board members. I have just a couple, a question or two and a, and a comment to make. I wanted to follow up on one thing Mayor Jones mentioned briefly about HNTB. You know, I believe in the very start of this meeting today, there was a comment that HNTB ran some checks or did something and either the Eton failed on those or I believe you said, or HNTB just didn't run them. And so for that to be almost the entirety of the discussion of HNTB on this issue, um, and again, you can explain why, maybe it's outside. Go ahead, please. ETAN was unable to run the report. So it was ETAN's responsibility okay. to run the reports and then for HNTB to validate. So in those reports that were provided, the majority, the most of them that were provided failed. They didn't work properly. And then there was also a group of those that they couldn't, they couldn't be validated because ETAN couldn't get them to run in the system. So thank you for that. That actually highlights my question or, or raises my concern even higher than about what I was asking because I didn't realize that. There's nothing in your report that to share about HNTB or their roles or their failures or what we should be looking at. One of our, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, our highest paid vendors of this whole agency's role in this. I, mean, I thought they were, in essence, our representative in this situation. Mayor, that is not in the scope of this investigation. If you would like us to further evaluate that, that's what we can we can do that, but we looked at with expediency, given the the concerns around the accounting and given concerns around the errors. That's what the objectives were for this investigation. Yeah, so my reply on that is I know that we are looking at as an agency our relationship, I believe, and all of our contracts, and we have a motion on that with the large vendor. Did you have something, Chair, to say? No, I was going to say, I, I mean, I think it would be prudent uh, to, at our April 12th meeting, have a representative from them to come and answer the questions to us. Pretty fair and simple. Sure, I would love that. But also, I do think some information should be 100%. prepared. Yeah. About what were their roles? What were their responsibilities? You know, I don't have that contract in front of me of h and on this issue, but yeah. I'm sorry. I, I just said that it's just in our bed. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And when that happens, what happens next is is my question. Who's in investigating it? And I do understand maybe at some point we will end up in closed session on, on if we're going to have legal issues. But um, I was just surprised that there wasn't anything else in there. I understand your, that if you think that wasn't on the scope, I understand. But they were a major, major player in this whole relationship that I think failed this board dramatically. The other comment I wanted to make, um, I didn't hear anybody say this today. And <clears throat> to me, this is a truth. So this is, I will say it. Our board, I think, bears some responsibility for this problem. 
it was very clear to me in January of 2023 that the relationship with the CEO and the board was an adversarial relationship. It was clear to me that staff could see that the CEO was in charge and he was the one they had to please. It was clear to me that there was defense going on from parts of this board, and it did feel to me that there was defense as well from some of the staff and, and as well as the council, almost always of the CEO. I, it really, I believe, helped create a culture of he's above board, he, he does not work for the board, he can say whatever he wanted to this board, he could yell at the board, he could do things that were not directed by the board, and maybe behind the scenes, maybe whatever, there was, you know, attempts to address it, but I'm glad we have moved on from that, and I'm not trying to go back and cast dispersions on anyone, but I think it's important to note because we're still running this agency and we're going to get a new CEO. And I just believe it's essential to acknowledge that we could have done better and we should definitely do better to ensure that the culture of this agency is one that this board runs this agency. This board runs this agency. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Duncan. And I, I will say, you know, I've been on this board now for a year and a half and as the chair, right? A year and a couple of months. And, uh, that was one of the top priorities in making sure that the CEO understood what his role was. And as a board, we made a decision of what the next steps were. And I think all of us can take accountability for that. Um, we're not going to sit here and say, like, you know, who hired him, who didn't hire him, what happened before, what didn't happen before. But I think to your point, uh, and part of the discussion that we had at our Sandag board retreat was what is the CEO that we want of the future? Because I think was there is the responsibility we take now for members prior to us being in, these in this capacity in this role, what we our responsibility is. And then as we're moving forward, what are the things that need to be institutionalized? And what are the things that we need to be very clear with the next CEO and the executive leadership team and the culture of this entity so that it is clear about how we ensure that the public good is always a top priority and that we are informed as, as we should. So um, completely, completely agree on that. Uh, Council Member Brookholder. Perfect timing. I just finished my breakfast at 11. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. I um, also appreciate all of my colleagues. Um, you know, as, asked many of the questions that I had. Um, so given all of the known issues prior to the program going live, I can't imagine why Eton was in business at all. You and I both know private business can never operate that way. They would be out of business because it's performed so poorly. So I just wanted to ask if during the course of your investigation, if there was any looking into potential relationships between Eton and the CEO or CFO? There was not. Okay, I think that would be helpful. I mean, because there's there's no logical reason that we would be using a failed <laughs> system. I mean, there's just no logic around that. So there has to be something somewhere. Um, okay, so how many state route 125 accounts are there? There are about 89,000. Okay, 89,000. And just based on the chair's comments and some of the other comments, um, along with other other members, um, can the tolls be stopped while the back of the house is getting worked out with all the kinks and the failures and I don't know. Oh, I would not be able to answer that question. Anybody? It would be legal or management. I, I think it's. Okay, so there's the question, technically, can you turn tolls off? Technically, you can. We have accountability to the people who we received a loan from, and we're paying off that loan. So if we stop collecting tolls, we're not paying off the loan. So right. I think these are the things that we're, we're looking into right now. How could we pay it off? How could we get to a place where we're not collecting tolls any longer? And that's the report that we will be bringing to you before the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, I mean, I'm just considering, you know, that the negative impact it has on, and, and we had talked about equity and all those things earlier. So I, it's not fair to tax someone, which is essentially what it is, for uh, a failed system, right? I mean, if I'm a user and it's not working, I'm not gonna pay for it. 
Okay. Thank you for looking into that. And to Council Member Duncan's point, I think, you know, I'm, this board acted to fire the Eton Pan, however you say that, um, because of its failure. And I'd like to suggest maybe maybe it's an amendment to your motion, Chair, um, that we suspend essentially using HNTB due to their failures. I mean, they were supposed to do all of this stuff, the tech support, project management, I don't know, including reviewing bugs. I mean, they, they didn't do what they said they were going to do. So that would be my suggestion. Council member, I, I appreciate that. And would you be okay with us bringing, instead of adding it to this amendment, but it's duly noted and we bring that item into our closed session on Friday so that we can follow up to the other discussions, unless it can be had in open session, I'm not sure. I just, I think both council member Duncan asked for, for some of the, not only the response, but I wanna make sure that we are in a space where we are, because I know there's been some negotiation issues. So I, can you share? within the scope of what we talked about before in closed session, it would certainly be appropriate to follow up on those discussions as we come back to you in closed session on this subject. That's acceptable, thank you. Thank you, anything else, council member? Okay, uh, Mayor Wells, please. Hi, Courtney, thank you for the report. I've got a couple of difficult questions for you. Um, in regard to HNTB, how many dollars flows from Sandag into HTNB, HNTB each year? Mayor Wells, I um I don't have the answer on how many in relation to in to in totality with the various okay. HNTB contracts. I can tell you that there was a combination of seven point four million, and that relates to both their responsibility, oversight responsibilities over the ETAN and the CAPTCH oversight, and then one point, let me make sure I can, 1.2 million to oversee both. Um, and then the remainder was for the BO system, BOS system only. That so accounts for this SR 125 issue, but there are other, um, contracts that HNTB has with Sandeg, correct? Correct. Yes. This yes. is just, I'm speaking to... Do you what? have an overall dollar amount? I don't currently have the overall Mayor dollar Wells, amount. Would you be okay with management responding to that question, or would you like to wait until you finish your questions? I, it, let, yeah, let me finish, because oh, I, I'm that, actually I can moving in a direction. And then, then, yes, I would love to hear the response. Um, are you aware that HNTB has financed or paid for um, political advertisements and political support of sales tax initiatives in the past. Mayor, I am aware of that through the public media accounts. Yeah. Um, is it possible that we are protecting HNTB through, by protecting Eton, really protecting HNTB because uh, San was obsessed with raising $160 billion for a transportation system and wanted wanted to raise the sales tax, and so was protecting HNTB in order to achieve that goal? Mayor, as the independent auditor, I will always speak to what we evaluate either through an investigation or through an audit, and so I cannot speak to that question. And, and I'm sorry for leading you through that because I'm, I'm getting to a point. My, my point is, these are questions that, that are kind of above the mechanics of what we're talking about today. These are the more larger political questions. Uh, what how how rotten is Sandag? How how deep does the rot go? And how political is all this? I don't think it's fair to ask Courtney Ruby to to answer those questions. I think we need an independent investigation, completely independent of Sandag. And looking into the, we've heard, it's not just me today. I've heard people talking about criminal accusations. I, I've heard talk, people talking about sy systemic failure of, of the entire organization. It's not within the scope of what uh, Ms. Ruby is supposed to be doing. We need a political investigation, somebody who look at all the aspects of it. And so I would move a substitute motion that the independent investigation is not done by Courtney Ruby, but it's done by an outside agency chosen by this board. So to be clear, the independent investigation uh, 
recommendations are not being all done by Courtney, right? So the assessment of the finances in that role is being done specifically by a different entity that is going to be overseen by uh, our, our OPA, OPA, OIPA and in partnership with the board. So just need clarification for that. Are you asking for a separate? I am asking for a separate independent investigation by auditors chosen by this board. Okay, and can you tell me what a political investigation is? Because that's what you just called it. I did not call it a political investigation. What I you did? No, I said there are political aspects to this. Oh, I'm if, sorry. Okay, if you so, want to argue about no, no, I'm not going to argue. Should, but I'm asking for a full investigation of not not just the SR 125, but but where this goes. What what is this uncovering about Sandag in general? I think we we need to look at all of our relationships with all of our vendors and see if there was something untoward happening that that the public should know. Look, in 2004, Sandag was involved in a controversy because it hid the amount of money that was going to be coming in from a sales tax. Happened again in 2017. Um, this I've been on this board since 2013. There have been multiple scandals. The public has lost their patience. We uh, Gary Gallegos had to lose his job. Then we hired Hassan. By the way, hi, Hassan, I, I can't say that because it happened close session. I'm sorry. Um, then we hired Hassan. Now Hassan has left. We're pinning all of the problems of, of this particular problem, which I think is just the tip of the iceberg, on Hassan. Now our CFO has left. We had our finance director fired, and now there's a there's a criminal, or not criminal, there's a uh, civil suit involved in that. I don't know what the truth is. I, I, I don't think anybody in this room really knows how deep this goes, and I think we should know. So I'll, I'll leave it to, to the, the board to decide what kind of investigation, but I think there should be an investigation that happens outside of our inner circle. So that, that would be my substitute motion. Yes. Can I ask for clarification on that? I, of course. I, I think what you're asking, I don't know for sure, but I okay. I think what you're asking, definitely not political. I, I would want to see something that is a contract, specifically about contracts, how we are sourcing the contracts and how we're awarding the contracts. Because I really think it, based on what actually, I mean, it was very vague. There wasn't any, there were no metrics that were showing, because I brought this up in my comments, there were no metrics showing how um, ETAN was even in the running and how ETAN was actually awarded this contract. So I think what you're asking is, how do how does that happen? HNTB, how did they become one of our vendors? What how do we use them? And you know, we just actually used them recently for another project, even after this, which is yeah. baffling to me. Specifically, I, I I'd like to know if we were we were supporting or protecting organizations like HNTB, not maybe not just them, in order to achieve political gains, especially in regards to sales tax and I, I want to know what the personal relationships are between the people that work at Sandag and maybe and board members with these organizations and if that affected the outcome of awarding contracts or protecting contracts. So, I'm not a, yeah, I'm not sure where we're going. This is in relation to this particular item that's before us, correct? Sure. Okay. I, I I could use an attorney's help, so thanks. I want to make sure that I understand and and hopefully all of us understand. So the motion is up there, but it includes the 10 recommendations, right? That, yeah, that yeah, are so listed I, up there. And, I and, that in addition. Yeah. And, and so my, my question is, hopefully maybe it'll clarify a little bit for me or for all of us, is on number one, it says an independent assessment of the finance department's policies, procedures, and practice to ensure adequate internal controls including proper review and supervision over all of Sandag's financial operations. So what do we mean by independent assessment? Was that going to be a third party hired? That was what I thought. That, that yes, that is what we're asking for. And that's what the recommend, you wanna just go ahead and clarify that. And, and it, then it is, the part yes. that I was really interested in was making sure that they're not reporting to Sandag leadership team or executive team, not because I don't have faith in it, but because I wanna make sure that it's extremely transparent and accountable and and fair. So, 
So this recommendation is very specific in relation to what we found in the investigation. This is saying, based on what we saw, the finance department needs to have an independent assessment by financial experts coming in and saying top to bottom, what are the policies, practices, structure? Is there proper internal control supervision? It's not that my team couldn't do it. It's not the best use of our, our resources to do that. So we want a CPA firm or a firm with such qualifications to come in that does this day in and day out to, they'll be most efficient to bring this because the no, I, and I understand needs that. to and, occur quickly. And I appreciate that. Yes. I, the reason I'm, I bring this up, Chair and, and Mayor Wells, is whether or not if you're asking, if, so there is some independent activity going to occur. And if you're looking, whether it can be broadened is your motion potentially or your request in, in number one, or if you're asking for something very different. I'm just trying to help with the motion. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. It, well, part, part of it, I I was under the impression based upon the discussion we had with uh, Mayor Jones and Mayor Voss, that the audit was going to be in-house with our own internal auditor. Is, is that not the case? The request for clarification, uh, the the component that says the board is also requesting OIPA to conduct an investigation to determine whether the SANEC legal team, executive team, and or board members were made aware prior to the general board. That is the, as a follow-up to this particular assessment that was done. If my understanding is correctly, Mayor, Mayor Wells, is that you actually want, you're asking for it to be broader than this particular item 125, because that's what I've I've heard you say a couple of times. Okay, let's step by step. I, I still am confused about, is this a completely independent audit that we're talking about, or is this an audit under the auspices of, of uh, our internal auditor? So, Mayor Wells, I am the independent auditor. I am the I, no, internal I, I, auditor. I, so, so I guess what, I, what I'm saying is I'd like to see an auditor that is not employed by Sandag, that, it, that is not somebody that that is in this organization at all. Mayor Grant. I, I, I certainly understand uh, the substitute motion being offered and feel very strongly that uh, we should uh, go in the direction that you're talking about. I do question whether it's appropriate as part of this special meeting to give that direction. And when I first started, uh, when I said my comments, uh, I had come to this meeting and, and pulled uh, our general counsel aside and asked about the ability to go into closed session here today, and we don't have that ability. And as I thought about it, I think it's better to go into closed section after we have the opportunity to direct what it is that we're interested in doing. And I'm interested in taking gloves off and getting to the bottom of what is going on around here. And so that would mean, I don't want a lawyer necessarily uh, just to kind of look at the legal aspects. I want an investigator to, you know, turn over every friggin' rock. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. And so, but I don't think adding it to this motion is the appropriate. And I'll tell you, just let me, just for clarification, I'll tell you why I did it. Because you, you all may remember that I have asked repeatedly for an independent investigation and have gotten zero response. I have asked repeatedly for information about HNTB. The question I asked about how many contracts does HNTB have? How many dollars? It shouldn't be hard to give me that information. I don't have it. Does anybody have that information? And that tells me that there is a spirit of of wanting to hide information from the board. I, I think it's pretty clear what we're all talking about today. We didn't get the information. I don't think that's ending. I think a new CEO may or may not solve the situation, but I think the, the people that we represent require us to know. And so I don't know how we're going to we, know. Give me unless, one second. Unless we ch change it, change the direction we're going, and that's what I'm asking. Well, okay. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. So if I, I may just, just two things. First of all, Mayor Wells, you brought up, and I think it was probably two meetings ago, the request of all vendors who I, and we went back and listened specifically what to what you said, but all vendors who've been paid over $5 million. And so we now are compiling that list. We're figuring out like how many years to go back. My staff provided that information to me yesterday. I have not gone through it yet, but I, I will be getting that to you. So we have heard you and we want to provide that information. I want you all to know how important 
it is that we are completely transparent in how we do work with vendors. We've talked about the $1.3 billion budget that you all approved the draft at your last meeting. Only 5% of that budget is the Sandag staff. The way we accomplish the work is through our vendors. We have to get it right. We have to be transparent. And we are absolutely prepared to do a closed session and talk about how we, the, the process that we go through with vendors, how we hold them accountable, and to put additional controls in place so that you are comfortable as a board in how we are doing that. So we can agendize that as soon as you want to have that agendized. We can, I will be here any day that you need me here. So really it's up to you. So I will just kind of close. I want you to know we will get you that information. Thank you, Claire. It has been compiled and thank you. Can, can I ask a clear? Okay. All right, because I, I had pushed my button quite a while ago. So yeah, the, the, the problem is, is that we have, so oh, just sorry. for clarification, there's a lot of folks who have not spoken to the item. So uh, right now, the uh, discussion that I'm taking is based on, on the request that Mayor Wells has yes. asked, and that's why we jump around a little bit. There are people who are on this board who have not been able to have, have not spoken yet to the action before them. So go ahead, Courtney. Thank you, Chair. And through the Chair, Mayor Wells, I just want to... As the oversight for the board, when AB 805 was created, it was to create an independent performance auditor so you all would have oversight given the level of significance of the issues that have been presented. So at the forefront of how I do my job is risk. And I just want you to understand from a contracting standpoint, I think this is important that you have this information. In evaluating in the short time that I've been here, I am making one component of my team solely focused on contracts because of the level of risk that we are discussing. So that will mean that we are constantly auditing contracts. Additionally, this whistleblower program, if you have not been in an organization with an effective whistleblower program, it is we create a cone of silence so that employees, contractors, I will advertise everywhere. I will go to bidding conferences. They will know if there is something amiss out there that it is to come to me. In my work as your independent performance auditor and my past experience, I have worked with every level of government in relation to investigations. So I I just want to assure you the concerns you have, the gravity that you have, this is why you have an independent performance auditor. No one knows what my team and I do. We do it on behalf of you. We make sure that the public is kept abreast. So on behalf of you, as well as the public, because this is how important accountability and transparency. We will look if there is issues of concern in relation to fraud, we will investigate that. We will get the proper partners involved in that. So I just want to make sure you understand the level and degree of what my independence is and where I will go. I just is sure. the, is your auditing different than Mary Kay's? Uh, is, is it the same? It is different, sir. That's something I didn't understand. Okay. Chair, sure. I, I, can I make uh, comments regarding this? I Because I have to leave. Okay. And um, first of all, um, I I think that uh, the uh, bill. I, I think that it's a we should handle that in a different situation other than this uh, motion here. But I'm 100% with you on it. And some of the reasons are is because I think past board members used uh, the weighted vote uh, many times to protect Hassan. And um, one one example of that is uh, I remember when there was discussion about the uh, upcoming um, November ballot measure for um, taxation for Sandag um, in the early stages before it was actually put into play. Uh, Mayor Bailey questioned uh, Sandag's participation in crafting and um, providing information and supporting that with uh, the union that came forward to uh, put it, and he was shut down immediately. And um, it was uh, board members that, uh, uh, colleagues, board members who shut him down. Um, and so I think that question that you asked specifically about HNDB and their uh, activity with um, 
um, political action um, should be uh, looked at. Not only that, but um, I think that when you go back and you look at a lot of the team meetings, maybe you should look, should look at some of the um, board decisions that were made via a weighted vote. And because some of those uh, folks that were heavily involved in the weighted vote um, may have um, participated in uh, closed session meetings outside of the um, board meetings and uh, had um, probably predetermined how the voting was going to be, which, and just because people aren't here now, just because the CEO isn't here now, uh, doesn't mean that they can't still be held uh, accountable, either civilly or criminally, for uh, different types of um, uh, breaches of the law. And that's something that we need to know. And we need to see that uh, because those folks that uh, may have participated in that as board members, uh, needs to, I hate to say it like this, but it's a great lesson to other board members that are here today. And I'm not saying anybody's gonna be doing this because I think we have a different kind of um, thought process here today uh, with board members than we did in the past. Uh, but going few, uh, forward, people have to know that just because you're not here, you can still be held accountable. And that's, so I, I support you 100% on where you want to go with this. Thanks. So Mayor Wells, are you okay with us moving that item forward as part of our closed session agenda for next April, Friday, April 12th? Okay, so we, we can agendize the, my um, request. To have a discussion in closed session, yeah. Okay. Yes, I'd be glad to withdraw that if we, as long as we discuss it. Thank you. Good. You got it, Councilman Machu. Thank you. I hope we move through the questions soon since several of us may have to leave soon. So I'll make my comments real brief. I, I agree with and, and support on many of the statements I've made today by all my colleagues. And I really appreciate the independent uh, auditor's report and the way it was written and it was, the way it was presented to us so quickly after she first came to us. Um, um, and I'll just make a, a brief comment similar to what uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Duncan uh, made, which is um, we own it. The buck, buck stops somewhere and actually stops with all of us. The culture that Sandag was working with, is working with, the institutional culture has been with Sandag for a long time. And this board, and I've watched this board for many years, over a decade, uh, created that culture and supported that culture. Um, and that's the culture that we have to work with to change and amend, which will take a long time, will not change even if the leadership changes. In fact, the board can change and that culture doesn't change very much. The CEO can change. It is up to us to make a conscious decision to change that culture rather than trying to pick on individual people. It is a culture of the organization that I think we need to address, uh, not just individuals or performance. And that culture was created by this governing body. And many of you were here for a long time and helped create that culture. So we need to own it and, and work to, to change it. And I hope we do it in a way that is positive thinking rather than trying to find victims. Uh, so I hope we move forward with that kind of approach. That, that is, uh, I think, the best way to, to build any organization to be the one, the kind of organization we would like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Ross? Thank you. Courtney, thank you to you and your team. I really appreciate the thorough, in-depth uh, information you've provided. This is so breathtakingly and disturbingly similar to what happened in 2016, 17. Not a lot of us were here back then. We undertook a thorough investigation that was healthy at the time. I will definitely be in support of Mayor Wells's recommendation to have a thorough independent outside investigation that covers all of that at the appropriate time. I appreciate the chair's uh, inclusion of allowing Courtney to dig deeper. Uh, it's critical that we learn who knew what and when and why nobody had the courage to inform the board. We can fix procedures and processes, but if we have people still with us here that kept the board in the dark, 
We need to know who they are and they need to be terminated. Council member, I mean, it's your turn. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Deputy Mayor Gasterlin, thank you, Chair. Oh, sorry. Um, first, I wanna thank, thank our Chair for calling this meeting so promptly and bringing us together. That was a bold move and it was very important and thank you. Mm -hmm. And I wanna thank you, Courtney Ruby, for being clear and decisive and bringing this report. So I'd like to just list a few things that I would like to see included under the last sentence that's in the amendment here. So what did we hear from Council Member Marinas? We wanna know who knew back in May, 2022, um, that there were issues and we want to know why uh, the system went live anyway. We also want to know why it took so long to get to the board. We want to know who in Sandag continued to approve invoices, even though HNTB um, had recommended not to do so. And I'd like to add to this. Um, so new software built on the fly has bugs. You know, it just does. And what was approved when the contract with E10 was approved was a software system that existed that was still in testing, had about 90% of the testing done, 10% to be done. That's very, very different from software where 10% has not been written yet. Um, writing new code is completely different. And I can say this with personal authority and experience. Um, testing is everything. So I'd like to add, when was it clear that E10 was in the midst of developing new software, not testing a system, and what mechanism was missing at the time that they were not disqualified at the moment that, that their, their state of being was in? Um, I'd also like to understand the $2 million, well, so first, a quick question. The $1 million that you talk about, is that in addition to the $2 million or is the two? Okay, so we're yes, talking sir. about $3 million total. Okay, great. I'd like to know what percent of the SR-125 revenues that represents, and I'd really like to understand the commercial revenues versus the residential revenues. And it sounds like these accounts are mostly if not all personal or residential, whatever we want to call them, or non-commercial revenues. And I bring this up because you noted in your report that ETAN would have been responsible for the Otay Mesa East automated crossing. Um, and that automation in the crossing is the centerpiece of this $1.13 billion project. Otay Mesa East is incredibly important going forward to freight movement, and to really streamlining cross-border activity. And we should remember you know, that SR-125 was built to connect the only commercial port of entry in the San Diego area to our regional freeway network. So this is not a tempest in the teapot. This 2 million is not a teeny tiny immaterial amount. And I really appreciate the distinction between material, materiality and accuracy. Um, Materiality is relative. This is the tip of an iceberg. I'm so glad that we've arrested it right here, frozen it perhaps is a better way to say it, and that we're going to fix it. So I'll end on a note of positivity looking forward. I'd really like to see our board find a way to adopt an explicit policy that we are committed to acknowledging, accepting, and fixing software-based errors as they arrived, arise. And you know, I, Del Mar has been you know subject to errors. I'm actually going to report this to you now that I know that this is a path. And I, I think we owe it to our constituency, to our jurisdiction, to every single person who uses a highway or a road in San Diego County to make sure we do this right. So I'll repeat it. I'd like to see this board be open to a policy, creating a policy where we acknowledge, accept, and fix. We commit to that to software-based issues, to fix them as they arise. So thank you. And my questions have been answered and I'm sure I'll get these numbers okay. now that I've asked for them. Thank you. So just, uh, I wanna just make sure that we're really, um, I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak who has not spoken yet. I have two people on the queue, uh, Mayor White and Deputy Mayor Kime. Um, I know that this is a very important 
vote for my colleagues. So I want to make sure I know people have to leave. They had a time certain. A lot of people had time certain at 1130. So I want to give you your time to speak. But I want to just make sure that if the folks who are still in the queue who have already spoken, if you are, um, I would like to call the question after my two colleagues speak. But if there's something that is extremely important, we'll open it up. But go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I think all of my concerns have been addressed. One of the main concerns was exploring some sort of a whistleblower program, so thank you for that. And the only thing that I think I can add to this is uh, uh, just recognizing the SANDAG staff who have essentially taken on the responsibility that should be uh, ETANs and, and thank them for that additional work that's on top of their daily duties. Thank you. Quick as well. I just want to make sure when we get the additional report back, it focuses on a couple of things. So we hired H and TB as the owner's rep, correct? That is correct. And, we hired, yeah. and that was before ETAN, correct? That is for this correct. project. And so uh, essentially an owner's rep, a good way is there to serve as a liaison and ensure that owner's best interests are carried out and the project moves um, on track and without overruns, correct? This report did not go into those details, but that is my understanding. But I, management may want to address that. But and that's all. Um, H and TB, uh, them hiring them as the experts because we're not toll road experts. Did they recommend us choosing ETAN? Because right now we're putting the responsibility of choosing ETAN on staff, which I'm sure rec uh, relied on recommendations. My understanding, this was a public process, so the information that uh, Mayor Jones spoke about there. Everything should be able to be provided in relation to how the bids were rated, who was sat on the evaluation panel, all of that information, where ETAN was ranked, is is would be available documentation. Okay, I just that's, if we can get into that when we go and see, um, did HNCB recommend ETAN? Did we follow their recommendations? How that RFP process go? Because if we, um, if um, if they recommended ETAN and now we've paid H and to be to be the owner's rep and it's been a failure and we have to extend the um, the tolls and put that on the backs of 125 um, toll payers. That's a concern for me. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, sorry. Acaba? Yep. Okay, I'll be very uh, very very quick. I want to thank the chair and Courtney and David for everything. Um, I want to thank Mayor Jones for that amendment there. Uh, I wanted to build on what Mayor Wells said. What I'm concerned about is timeline. We're trying to hire a CEO, and we don't know if, as Mayor Wells suggests, this runs very, very deep, and this new CEO won't know what they're walking into, or if it's very shallow, and in fact, this was just people that every day woke up going, we can fix it, we can fix it, we can fix it, and a year and a half goes by, uh, and we get into the mess that, that everybody's talked about. So I'm very concerned about timelines. I would ask the management report. We're going, you're coming back after the fact. We're already telling you to, we want to take the auditor's recommendations that you have a timeline for us and that we figure out a timeline for all of this. Because I think the sooner we get this button down, understand what kind of corrections need to be made, that we need to get this before we hire a CEO so they know exactly what, what they have to work with in this organization. But I, I appreciate all the comments that have been made over this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I wonder if we could uh, make a couple of real small adjustments to this. Is that possible or is that not on the table? Because if you, would you basically to respond to Deputy Mayor Gastelin's point, number one could say an independent assessment of the Sandag board and finance departments so that we make sure that they're not focused exclusively on the policies of the finance department, but maybe there are some board policies that should be addressed as well. And then the other thing I'd like to get on the record before we take this vote is what to uh, the executive team does uh, immediately mean? I mean, we're gonna adopt these. In number nine, it says, Sandag implemented daily reconciliation process between the CAPS roadway system and the ETAN and fast lane system be put in place immediately. Does that mean starting tomorrow or do we have to hire people to do that? How, how is that, how immediate are we talking about there? Correct me if I'm wrong, um, to Courtney, these are the official recommendations that OIPA is making to us. I'm happy to make that adjustment uh, for number one to make that addition. You know, as I stated, I also want to make sure that it's very clear about who they report to. But then I think when management responds, right, 
my understanding is those those recommendations will be part of this. They should be responding by April 8th of next week, which will be a public document. And so addressing your specific question about timing, I think will be extremely important in that report. And then I think to Council Member LaCava's request, um, it is absolutely uh, imperative that um, the next CEO understands uh, you know, where we are, which is, you know, why some of the comments about the Office of Compliance and Ethics and the uh, the organizational structure, there's a lot of work that needs to take place from the just stepping back and looking in. And I think that's why I'm happy to have that bigger assessment done. Um, I do want to um, remind folks that there are folks at Sandag who come here every day to do an absolutely wonderful job. And our responsibility as a board is to take a deeper dive to see where there are uh, systemic issues, uh, human error, uh, actual, if there's anything that is um, implicitly uh, not legal, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanna remind the staff who works for Sandek, who is listening here, is that uh, we, we know that they come in here to do their jobs every day to try to make sure that they're accomplishing the mission of Sandag. And our job and our responsibility is to make sure that um, that the tools are in place, systems are in place, that we actually make institutional change so that whomever the next CEO is understands what the directive of this board is. And, and I will be very honest with you, right? There are tools that have been created uh, from the way to vote, et cetera, et cetera, that people use for whatever reason, right? Um, I've made a choice to work very clearly with this board and the way to vote has only been used once under my tenure. Um, it was a request that you all made as a board, but it is a tool in the toolbox that is available. Now, whether there's any illegalities or political implications of work that has been done prior to us, um, you know, we move forward. But I think it's extremely important that we are reminded that um, as a board, we have a responsibility to do the right thing for this agency, for the taxpayers, and for also the staff who has been so dedicated to the work that they do every day. And so um, I think you you feel comfortable with? Yeah, okay. All right, with that, I'm, I had called the question. Yes, ma'am. So the first recommendation is for financial department evaluation. And I just wanna make sure if it can either be, be done as a separate recommendation because I want to make sure that you get what you want. So if you could clarify exactly what you want the board policy assessed on. So I think there's may, maybe, and I don't know, uh, Mayor, you can tell me. I think one of them is addressed based on the recommendation and the request that both uh, Mayor Ba and Mayor uh, May, the Mayor made around the issue of assessing for this particular issue, who knew, who didn't know, right? That's what's on the last one. But I think to your point, as as Courtney responds, uh, as we're looking at, at taking a deeper dive, which is what Mayor Wells and, and some of the other members have asked for, I think that that is the directive we can give at our next board meeting about specifically what we want. And so what I would recommend is that if any of you have specific um, specifics of what you want to see in that investigation, if you can share it with me, and we'll make sure that we work through it so that we have a recommendation for the board uh, as we're moving forward. And of course, if it doesn't have everything that you need, once um, you know the agenda is public, you're happy to make any changes as necessary. Yeah, and I just, you know, to me, when I read read this, and and uh, I, I read it after uh, W. Mayor Gastelum's comments, um, Sandag's financial operations ultimately are the responsibility of the board. So this this kind of narrower view of just the finance department policies to me um, is is not as broad as I would like it to be. But um, I know I'm going to be here at least through November, December timeframe, and um, I will uh, make it my business to yeah. encourage. So well, I'm not really worried about uh, whether it gets yeah. changed here or not. If, if she's uncomfortable with it, that's fine. I'm yeah. We'll bring it back for the next meeting in, in, uh, on Friday of next week. Right. Great. Okay, it's good. just about expediency. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mayor. Okay. So I called the question. Do uh, you have a motion before you with the additional changes? Uh, please vote.
that motion passes unanimously with those members present. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't think we changed the motion, right? No. What did we? I'm sorry. Did you? Okay. I think we should be good, right? Did you see any we'll, irregularities? We'll your conditional second for the record. How about that? <laughs> All right. Well, again, thank you so much. I hope uh, today is um, Good Friday. I hope uh, for those that celebrate, you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you for um, coming together. I know people had to move a lot of different things to come here today. So very much appreciate you. The next board meeting uh, of our board of directors, April 12th. And I think we're going to have a pack agenda. So plan on being here for a while uh, because this is very important as we move forward. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.